Welcome to Sheboygan, Wisconsin for the 2023 Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge. I am Mike Iwaski along with F1 Powerboat Championships, Thomas Yarbrough. Thomas, you've done one offshore race, but now you're in Sheboygan to do one more. Yeah, it's uh, super excited. Uh, the second collaboration between the Formula One Powerboat Championship Series, the tunnel boats that I announce uh, throughout the country uh, all summer long, and the offshore classes. So kind of two merging, a merging of two different disciplines within the American Powerboat Association brought together here in Sheboygan by Mercury. What a great event we're going to have this weekend. And what a beautiful town we're in. This is my first ever time here. I've spent a lot of time in Michigan in this northern region, and this area did not disappoint. Thomas just told me that Sheboygan actually has a very big surfing culture up here, which I find to be interesting because I was looking out at the water, which is a little bit rougher today. You can see in your shot there a little bit of a swell coming into the harbor uh, talking about just how rough it is here and saying that they can surf yeah yeah there's actually a couple places you know in the Great Lakes I know being from Minnesota up on Lake Superior they'll put on the dry suits when they get those big winds that'll come in from the east and pound uh, the shores of Lake Superior there in Duluth and obviously with this easterly wind you're going to have that here as well well what a beautiful community though. just a beautiful place nice clean beautiful water green grass just a great place to go racing we want to thank you Boygan us for having us here Mercury Racing for bringing us here uh, just going to be a great weekend there's the hotel that we're just right outside that just to the right hand side of your screen right where the tent is this is going to be where the pits are that's the uh Sheboygan Yacht Club Youth Sailing School right there with all the sailboats behind the boats, but we're craning offshore powerboats in this weekend. So this afternoon, what we're going to bring you is Class 1 qualifying, supposed to start right around 3.30. We just had 2-2-2 Offshore Australian Navy go out and do a parade lap, but Pothole Heroes, Husky Ice Spritz, looks like everybody's still sitting on the docks. They're going to do one parade lap, basically they're going to do one sight lap around the whole course, and then one boat will go at a time. It's going to be 2-2-2 Offshore Australian Navy starting off because they are your points leader in Class 1. Of course, tomorrow the racing will kick off with none other than the F1, F1 group. Yeah, we'll start off with a couple of four minutes plus one lap qualifying heats to set our, our grid for our, our love qualifying Fast lap qualifying, that'll set the grid for our qualifying heats. Then the total points of mass throughout the qualifying heats will set our starting order. A little bit different in the Formula One class that you see in the offshore. We run a modified Le Mans start, so motors completely shut off. They'll count down from one minute to 20 seconds. We'll go under starter's orders when a flag drops. That motor goes from a cold, cold dead fire to top speeds in under three seconds. Look at there, the 222 Navy. You know, interesting. I was surprised to hear, right, again, my first time with Class 1 in these beautiful boats with those twin 1100 competition Mercury Turbo uh, motors on the back. I'm surprised to see the leader of the points go out and the first time around, I figured they would want to go last. Well, yeah, but, you know, you're right, and the qualifying thing is still kind of new to, to, to P1 and still kind of get the bugs worked out. In, in Cocoa Beach, rather, uh, they actually went and did an extra lap. You could do an extra third lap. Um, that way you run your two. If you weren't happy, you go out and run the third. But uh, the problem is they haven't been able to see the course. They don't want to go out and do their qualifying if they haven't seen the course. Speaking of course, let's take a, let's take a look at the course here on Lake Michigan. As we are just where the Monster Energy logo is, a dogleg course on one side. And then a little bit back in that. So it's going to be the Monster Straightaway between number 10 and number 1. That will be the Monster Energy Drink Straightaway. Of course, Monster Energy, the official energy drink of P1 Offshore Racing. But that is your course here in Sheboygan. Now, it's very, very rough today. Uh, as we talked, you could do some surfing out here. I talked to some locals, and they said this will lay down later later today, tonight. There's going to be some storms that come through. Uh, right now, the wind's out of the southeast, probably about 15 to 20, I would guess. And by tonight, it's going to be blowing uh, out of the west southwest maybe a little bit of northwest and that should calm the water down tremendously so i talked to some super stock teams today briefly uh, while i was over at the yacht club they're not even going out and testing uh because they said everything's going to be different tomorrow what's the point of going out and testing day your guys tested out here earlier when i got here and i was like well there's no way those boats can run yeah i think uh, same thing that you were talking about with the sight lines right that's the guys went out there and just wanted to see understand the distances between the buoys how the course was laid out i don't think we saw a single one even come close to half power yep. let alone full power with that 17 foot long tunnel hall versus the you know 35 to, to 45 plus foot lengths that you have in some of the classes in offshore the the big waves that you see here on this big body of water definitely affect the formula one boats that you're going to see tomorrow significantly differently and a lot more violently they're just not designed to handle those, those giant waves like you guys are on the offshore side well this is uh, perfect conditions for them to flip over backwards so literally 
just really over backwards because they're going to come up and the wind will just carry them, carry them, carry them. And then once they get past that center point of gravity, uh, you know, that, that's going to be all she wrote. All right, I do see some boats coming out. Looks like we are getting some movement over here. Let's take a quick commercial break. We will be right back with the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge. Apologies, we had some te technical difficulties there. Thought we were getting to a commercial, but we weren't quite ready for that, so we'll continue to go live. Of course, there's the X-Insurance Good Boy Vodka boat. We've had a driver throttleman change in that boat. We now have Randy Kent and Grant Bruggerman running the X-Insurance Good Boy Vodka boat. And of course, they came in third place last weekend in Michigan City, Indiana, their first podium for that boat, the MTI, formerly known as Team Abu Dhabi. They just purchased that boat. Their first race was in Sarasota. Uh, unfortunately, their throttleman was in an in, uh, was in an accident. Uh, he's unable to race, so Randy and Grant have jumped in. This will be their second race together. Talked to Randy earlier. He said, "I've wanted to run a," he said, "I've wanted to run a boat with Grant for nine plus years. I just never got the chance, but now I finally got my chance." Getting word from our production booth. Now we can take that commercial. We'll be right back with live coverage of the 2023 Mercury Racing Midwest Grand Prix. Scanning. If you own a home or business, it might surprise you to see what is not covered in your insurance policy. There are gaps and exclusions in primary and umbrella policies that make you a target if an incident or claim occurs and you don't have the right coverage in place. And that's why you need a true umbrella policy from X Insurance. There are 40 million lawsuits filed every year in the USA. Let's get that target off your back. Welcome back to the Mercury Midwest Challenge. Beautiful Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Beautiful day here on Lake Michigan. Mike Yawaski, Travis or Thomas Yarborough. Sorry, he was thinking of Travis Pastrana there. Told you yesterday, I thought he might be showing up. He didn't come up here this weekend. It's be Carlos de Cicidia in the Pothole Heroes boat this weekend. Travis okay. ran in Sarasota, Florida over the July 4th weekend. We are waiting to get Class 1 qualifying underway. Here out on Lake, very rough Lake Michigan today. Yeah, it looks like it's been rough back-to-back -back weeks here. Opposite sides. Opposite sides, Opposite yep. Opposite sides of the coast, but you guys had some pretty hard, rough westerly winds pounding the east side of Lake Michigan and Michigan City last weekend. Yep. We saw in a class that's not here this weekend, but we saw a very large offshore boat basically get broken in half. Good thing those safety cells did their job, and drivers walked away completely unscathed. But, boy, what a... What a horrific crash that was. And, uh, you know, that is what happens when you look at Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, these big bodies of water in the central U.S., they can get real rough real quick. I was talking to some people at lunch, and, you know, they asked me, they said, do, you, do they underestimate a lake, right? Do they not think that a lake can get like that? And I said, yeah, probably just a little bit. I'm from the Chesapeake Bay, okay? Everybody thinks, oh, wow, you live on a bay. It can't be that bad. But the Chesapeake Bay is a mean, nasty body of water. I mean, it can flow out of the south. You figure it's a straight line down to Norfolk, and we get a southerly breeze. We can get five, six-foot-tall waves that are two feet apart right. on, on a bay, right? And nobody ever anticipates that. I never would have thought you'd be able to surf in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, but you can. I mean, these are breaking out far enough. If you had a longboard, you could catch some of them. It's actually laid down quite a bit since when I got here yeah, this morning and got time. up on this lift. We're, in a, we're on a man lift right outside uh, – right outside where the F1 boats are going to race. So they're going to be to our left, and then offshore is going to be to our right. So we're going to have two two different sides of racing. We can see all of our vantage points. Of course, Matt Trulio, uh, my third comment or our third commentator in the broadcast booth, he is currently working on some speed on the water work, and he'll be joining us tomorrow for the racing action all day. And all three of us are going to bring you all the racing. Thomas will lead the way for the F1 stuff, and I will lead the way for the offshore stuff. Yeah, now I was told, I'm filling in this week your normal 
uh, color commentator stepping into the cockpit this weekend here at the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge. Yeah, Mark Granite going to run back in super stock with his good friend Randy Swears and that savage uh, Doug Wright. Of course, Mark Granite, everybody knows, used to run the Miss Geico boat back in the day. Uh, he did a little bit of work with D.F. Young, and then he joined us at the broadcast booth for the 2023 season. But he's going to be back in the cockpit today. Savage went out and tested just a little bit earlier, and I was talking to some people, and they couldn't believe that you'd, you'd, you'd lose a 30-foot boat in the waves. And you could. I mean, one oh, yeah. of them would dive down in, and it would completely disappear, and you'd see it pop back up just to give you an idea of how rough it is. And if you look at it, I mean, you're from Minnesota, so I don't know if you're very familiar with the ocean, but, you know, oceans have long jetties like this that stick out right in front of us, and usually you get that wash just like you're getting here. So kind of think I'm in an ocean town, but it's not salt water, it's fresh water. Yeah, yeah I mean, when you, if, you, if you were to walk out on the pier blindfolded and take that blindfold off, you could question where you – are you – really in the Midwest I just on might. a freshwater bo body I, of water. But if you look around at, at the boats, and the boats are, you know, so clean and so nice and so new looking that you immediately know you're in freshwater because you don't have to deal uh, with saltwater like we do back east or they do down south. So I've seen boats come out of boatels that are 1977 Magnums, and they look like the day they rolled off the showroom floor. And I asked the guy, what would you do to the boat? And he goes, oh, well, I just put a back seat on it, and that was it. Right on. Let's talk about that, right? In the, in the Formula One tunnel boats, we hate salt water. Of course. Right? Because anything that gets in there, it just eats it alive. Any electrical problem, you, if you go over it all, you get any water in the boat, you basically just got to completely strip all yep. your electrical wiring. How does that affect the offshore teams when these boats are designed more to be run on right off the coast in salt water on a more regular basis? And this is kind of a, a different thing for them with just a couple events every year on fresh water. Well, in, in the offshore world, they don't want to go through a rooster tail. They, they'll avoid it at all costs if they don't have to do it. They will jump over behind a boat if they're behind a rooster tail, but you're talking maybe 30, 40, 50 feet behind a boat, right? right? You guys race in rooster tails. I mean, you're yeah. such you're tight quarters racing. There's nowhere else to go. I mean, you're designed to get wet. So it makes perfect sense that, you know, when that goes in that cowl on the top of the scoop of the boat, goes down, falls on top of the battery, it's going to corrode the battery terminals, it's going to corrode the wiring. You know, if last weekend when Dirty Money went over in Michigan City, Indiana, Believe it or not, the motors and the wiring are probably pretty salvageable out of the boat because it's fresh water. Yeah. In salt water, the moment a positive charged wire gets hit with salt water, it corrodes and turns green instantly, instantly. And that's why it has to be replaced. So you have to rip it out. Now, obviously, the teams will rebuild their motors if they go over and so on and so forth. But the differences between salt water and fresh water are amazing. And I used to work for the Geico team when they ran the turbine. And I remember they used to inject fresh water into their turbine in order to be able to keep the turbo, uh, the, the fans in the, inside the turbine from getting salt built up on them and eating away at them. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing what salt water can do uh, to, to these race boats. I can imagine, obviously, uh, the, the accident last weekend, there's going to be a, a long, arduous road uh, for that team to get back. I think, I don't know, was the boat a total loss? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, I think, you know, the, the Dirty Money team, they uh, posted that, you know, they'll be back, and it, it'll be hard to say. I mean, anything can be fixed, right? It's whether, whether you're going to trust it or not. It's amazing that it happened to that boat because it's just – I, I, I just, I've never seen a skater come apart like that. I've never seen something do that. There are a couple different speculations, and we won't get into any of that, you know, as Fair long enough. as Rusty and Billy were okay. Um, That's what's you most know, important. But Bo and, Bo and the team over there will get everything they can do to get that boat back together. Yeah, we got now we have the, the class ones here. It looks like they're, we still got some hatches up, uh, still waiting for everybody to get rolling here on this parade lap to start that qualifying. But it's going to be a doozy out here as they go fast lap around this 10-pin, six-mile course with that chicane. Is that a normal thing for you guys, just throwing a chicane on a back straight? More and more, yeah. So just to give everybody an update, um, just heard from our production booth that we are waiting to get the start buoy in place. It is not in place. They're having trouble getting it set. So uh, the P1 offshore group is trying to get that all set up. So that is what is causing our hold right now. Of course, you can see on the screen all of the uh, teams just hanging out, waiting to go uh, qualifying to determine who will start on the pole tomorrow for the first of two races. And this is being scored as a two-race event, not a one-race event. So you get points for Saturday and you get points for Sunday. So that'll be really good. Uh, this is considered, race, the, the, like I said, a two-race format for the Class 1 uh, World Championship. So back to your dog leg question. Uh, dog legs are becoming newer in offshore powerboat racing. Usually we would just run a big oval course, a big, you know, Big old course, basically. But uh, a couple of years ago, myself included, I put on a race and we put a dog leg in it because it just kind of mixed things up a little bit. It, it reversed everybody to give them a different line to go into a corner as they kind of had to think about their setup just a little bit more. Uh, I know Steve Curtis and Cocoa Beach, a couple of years ago, they incorporated a dog leg down there. Of course, Lake of the Ozarks, that is one big dog leg. That's just, just a general the the course, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just how it goes. But it just kind of gives everybody, a, you know, you have some people advantage, some people a disadvantage, I guess, right? I mean, if you're, you know, if you're on the inside of one turn, you're going to be on the outside of the other turn. So you've got to be able to manage your position uh, the whole way around the course. Something kind of new, but it's starting to get uh, more and more popular as the 
race sites continue to grow. For sure, yeah. yeah we, we run very similar shrunk down versions of what you guys run, but very typical in oval course. We do have a handful of courses now that are starting to incorporate that chicane. And what we found is it really it requires the teams to, to focus on every bit of dynamic of driving, right? You can't just set up a boat that may be not the best in the corners, but just has blistering straightaway speed so you can drag race everybody down the straightaways. When you put those chicanes in, it forces you to set up your boat with quality turning as well as that top speed. So you kind of got to find that nice blend between both versus just having a guy who's really good in the corners and then just blocks his way down the straightaways. And right. then the other guy who's maybe, you know, going way wide out in lane four, lane five, because he doesn't want to get tight to the pin and bog the motor down, but has just a hammer boat and just pins it down the straightaways and just runs out, runs everybody. Well, he's got a bigger wheel. He's got a top, right. he's got a top speed setup and not a small setup, so he can't get to that inside. Like you said, he's going to lose too much speed and he'll never be able to make it back up on this short course. Same thing in offshore power racing with his rough as here today. They're going to go with a small wheel setup. They're going to go with acceleration, right? Because they're going to be leaving the water quite consistently. Um, but the different thing about these twin turbo boats is, and I did have an F1 question. We'll get to that in a second. Oh. If you talk to Steve Curtis, who's undoubtedly one of the most famous, if not the most famous throttle men here, right? Sir Steve Curtis, one of my best friends in the sport. He will tell you that he actually runs the boat not with tachometers. He runs a boat with the boost gauges because turbo motors are not supercharged motors. They're turbo motors. They don't make instant power. You have to be in the turbo to be able to make your power. So he runs it off of boost gauges because he knows where the boost has to be on those Mercury Racing 1100s in order to be able to make the power. So he wants them to remain in that area. And in the in the turbine boat back in the day, if you talk to Scotty Begovich, it's the same thing. You never completely left out of a turbine because you wouldn't be able to get it back instantly. Blower motors, your, 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 your motors, two-stroke outboard motors, you get that instant power when you go to give it gas. These twin turbo motors, you don't get that. So you'll actually see not less throttling, but a different throttling style when you get into the twin turbo setups as you would compare to an eight, uh, you know, uh, Super Cat, you know, uh, Pro Stock or a uh, Mod V, um, V Extreme, any of those boats would be just a little bit different. But it's a learning curve with the twin turbos for sure. But back to F1, you guys don't use any steering assist at all. Is it still the cable system? Is it still cable steering? So we do actually have a lot of the guys will, that do have a, a, it's still cable steering, but it's but it, it has a power steering assist function okay. with okay. it. Especially when you look at these new APX motors, these big four strokes adding a lot of weight to the back. It's, it's it increased the torque significantly of these guys setting them into the turns. And so you, you do still have some guys that run old school, right? Because their fear is if that power steering fails in the middle, just like a car, right? A car yep. with power steering is impossible to drive yep. when it dies. Yep. A car without power steering may be a little tougher all the time, but it's still but fairly used manageable. To it. Correct. Yeah. And you're used to it. Right. So we have some guys that, that have chosen to go the, the power steering route. You look at you know, probably most of our top competitors these days have power steering, but some of the old school guys are like, I don't need one more thing to fail in the middle of a race that's going to cause me to completely change my my setup and my approach mid-race. Yep. So, but yeah, you, you still seeing a lot of the cables down the boat uh, on the outside of the boat. They're starting to disappear and they're starting to bury the cables on the inside, Kay. especially with that power steering assist. So you're seeing more of it these days. So they need to do that thing that the F the F1 drivers do. You see Max Verstappen do the the steering wheel the machine. They actually have a steering wheel trainer where it's like it puts resistance in the steering wheel, and they have to sit there and twist it as hard as they possibly can. And like I've seen videos of them. Come, on, I watched that show on Netflix. You know the one that's made Drive F1, to yeah, 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 made F1 like the most popular thing in America these days. I think next to F1 and Austria Power Racing. Um, you know, you see them do it, and it looks miserable, right? I mean, it just looks terrible. And then they have to do the thing with their heads where it's strapped in, and they got to, like, hold their head from pulling against it because of the Gs. So I imagine what you do in your boats is, is very similar to that with the turning, with the moving around in the cockpit, so on and so forth. And I'm a small outboard guy. I started doing hydro streams and checkmates and running close to 100 miles an hour in those boats. So I I appreciate what it takes to fly and what it takes to drive one of these boats. Oh, good old hydro streams. Yeah, you know, oh, I love a hydro stream. Hey, you know, uh, what, what, was your, what was your flavor of choice in the hydro stream lineup? I had a vector. Right on. So I've known Howard. I knew Howard Pipcorn for many years. Okay. Great guy, an absolute crazy person. Oh yeah. Uh, but what I've heard, yes. But but what boat builder isn't a little nutty? What boat racer isn't this is a true. little nutty? This right? is true. Howard's a great guy. Built some rocket ships on the water. I mean, you talk about like especially like the you look at the drag boat guys here. Those you still oh, yeah. see a ton of them running with with a ton of speed. But almost all of our drivers are running Hans devices, so they're all locked. Yep. They're strapped in yep. six point safety harnesses. We're running anywhere between our average cockpit now is between. Three and seventy-five hundred newton impact, 
Uh, are so they separate? Will they separate like in a drag boat? No, they don't. Okay. Nope. So these are these are bolted to the boats. They're not designed to break away like you see in the drag boat. And that's and because the drag boat's going a straight line. You put a breakaway capsule in a tunnel boat that snaps at four and a half, five Gs, going from 120 yeah. okay. miles an hour down to 60. You'll see that capsule just start to uh, slowly over time. It'll just snap off. Snap out of the boat. Not, that makes sense. I never thought about that, but you know that makes total sense. Yeah. So we've got some. I mean, the capsules these guys today, right? We've seen a. Uh, Everything has, has changed, right? No, just like it has an offshore. You went from open cockpits to enclosed cockpits. We went, you know, you go from enclosed cockpits that have large lids. The whole lid flips yep. open. Whereas now you've got that whole structural ring, much, much like you see the Halo on the Indy cars and the F1 cars now. Yep. They're adopting technology that we have implemented in, in offshore boats and Formula One boats for years. Yep. And I think that's because, right, we have a surface underneath us that is always ever-changing, and it throws the boats all over. You don't see an F1 car or an Indy car blow over all that often. You go to a boat race, you might oh, yeah. see an offshore or a Formula One boat blow over once a weekend. It's just a part of what well, we Well, easy on the with. offshore boats blow over once a weekend. That, that's <laughs> saying a bit much. F1 boats, I can see it. But, you know, I mean, the Hydrostream, I mean, the Checkmate was hard to drive, but it only had a V4 on it. You know, the Hydrostream had a 175 on it, was the biggest motor on the Vector, and it was, I mean, it, you know, what he did to design the boats and just how the boats flew, uh, it just... It just was amazing. I mean, it just made all the difference in the world. Um, you know, learning how to drive that boat. When you trim it, you trim it. All of a sudden, the boat just lifts, and it sets back down on the back of it. And, I mean, I, you know, I'm 45 years old, so at the time I was probably 16 or 17, so there was no hydraulic steering. You know, there was dual cable <laughs> ride guide steering, and that's the best you had, or maybe push-pull, but there was no hydraulic steering. So, you know, but as the motors have gotten bigger and these guys put these four strokes on the back of these boats, um, you know, like you said with your boats, it just takes so much more to steer it. Yeah, you, you know, I mean, especially I think all the guys who have the four strokes have moved over to some sort of assistance within the steering system just because that's such a large motor. I mean, you're looking at, we, I believe it was almost a double weight uh, from the original two right. five power heads yep. that we've ran the two eighties right years. Uh, we well we so we started off with we, we no longer run them because of the availability worldwide. Yep. But we used to run the the, the EFI V six um, two point five uh, Mercury two hundred eighty horsepower. Uh, I, I, don't, I think they ran maybe 280, maybe 296. I thought they were the same power heads that we ran at Superstock when they ran the two, two strokes in Superstock. Maybe they were a little bit tweaked. But, you know, Superstock used to run 280, basically yeah. 2.5 fuel-injected motor. So, I mean, that was Mercury's staple motor for Correct. X amount of years. I mean, yeah, nothing now you got guys like taking 225 Pro Max blocks and bolting new front ends on them because, right, I mean, the day of the two-stroke is – Go, slowly going the way of the Buffalo. It's just, it's the way it is. The four strokes are more dependable. Uh, they're more energy efficient. They're cleaner for the environment. And that's just the way things are going today. And it's great to see Mercury as well as P1, the Formula One Powerboat Championship Series, adapting this, right? The, the, what's the old saying? Adapt or die, yep. right? And and I appreciate that uh, my series leader, your series leader, recognize that this is the wave of the future and we're moving that way. It's weird to see guys flip open a laptop when they take their right. motor calling yep. off. But that's the way of the future, right? The computer integration is going to be how you figure out how to find the right setup, the right propeller, because it's no longer the guy who can spend the most money on his motor is going to win the race. Exactly. So I just got word from Race Control. I guess we're waiting for the pace boat. Uh, it looks like the triple two guy, uh, the two 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 offshore guys rather, are strapped up. I mean, it looks like they're ready to get in the boat. I don't see the Husky Ice Spritz guys anymore. So they may be getting down into the cockpit. It's not very hot here today, uh, so you might be able to sit in there, keep the hatch open, catch a little bit of this beautiful breeze coming off of Lake Michigan and stay pretty cool. Uh, but they do have air conditioning, you know, just in case they do get a little bit what? overheated in there. Oh, yeah. I know you've oh. got air conditioning in those F1 boats. Come hey, on. Are you kidding me? Oh, not a chance. Man, my guys. These guys won't go with electric power assist steering. There's definitely no way they're going to go with air conditioning. <laughs> well, uh, I will tell you this. I, I, I have never yet to see a Formula One powerboat with, uh, with air conditioning in it. Uh, maybe if the guy blow barrel rolls it on in testing and then breaks the cow the his right cowling off and has to run with an open cockpit and we call that air that might be kind of against the rules though i think he might not be quite allowed to do that but you never uh, know you know uh, we have actually had guys that um when we started incorporating caps fully capsule enclosed cockpits the first one to take it off mid-race was a gentleman by the name of steve d'souza now runs uh, Joe Gibbs Xfinity team has been running that for 20 years. Steve was a, a multi-time world and national oh, awesome. champion okay. in Formula One. But he had his visor, and he's had glasses his whole life, right? Uh, I don't know if he has astigmatism, or, but he had some pretty thick glasses. Oh, when you say visor, you meant just off of the helmet, not off right. of plus the, the right. visor, yeah. plus the Canopy. lid and the capsule. Right. It would fog up so bad when we'd be racing down in Georgia and in Florida, that humidity would come up. We, if there was a restart in the race and he'd have to sit for a while, he'd come back to the dock and they'd take the lid off and he'd run the rest of the race without the lid. 
because he couldn't see. He figured, hey, I'd rather see than not. Now, the, the lids have changed, right? The, the, just like they have an offshore, very oh, yeah. small lids. We're yep. getting down in a hole from the top, so you've got that structural support around you. The guys have a lot more room in the cockpit designed solely for safety purposes. I mean, remember back in the day, I mean, those things were tight and real narrow. Now we're seeing guys that where even a guy my size can get in one of these cockpits. Right. 15 years ago, they'd laugh if a guy my size tried to get into a cockpit. And that's just not right. You know, it is what it is. Guys like me were built maybe a bit more for offshore racing, but I grew up around Formula One tunnel boat racing. It's a passion I have. It's what I love. Um, And I'm super excited that I get to to be with other disciplines. You know, so often we're kind of in our own little lane. We we bring three classes to almost every race we normally run. A a little bit different here, but Labor Day weekend we're going to be in Grove, Oklahoma uh, for boats, brews, and BBQ. Live music, two nights, racing. We're going to have all three classes. We'll probably bring... Uh, 40 to 50 boats in our three classes oh, awesome. to that race yeah, that on Labor Day weekend in Grove, Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, I just enjoy seeing different things, right? A, somebody who's been around powerboat racing as long as I have, it's kind of appalling. It's a few offshore races or other disciplines within the APBA that I've seen. I've not been to very many stock outboard races. I've not been to many inboard races, not been to many offshore races. I've done a few of them. I've yep. uh, been out to Seafair a few times when we ran with the uh, Unlimited Hydroplanes yep, and the out west out there, out west. But uh, I enjoy, really enjoy doing this because I can see what's happening in a tunnel boat before it's going to happen a lot of times. I can right. imagine in offshore you do the same yep. thing. But it's nice to try to hone those skills and learn what the heck is going on? I mean, there's a lot of times that this weekend something will be happening on the course, and you'll know it's going to happen, and I'll have no idea. Oh, exactly right. And, you know, it's funny that you say that because with P1, they also have aquacross. Right. Right? Okay, so that's the jet ski racing. So in St. Pete, they they did it in St. Pete. Um, I think we did it in Michigan City, Indiana, too. And I would get to go <laughs> commentate with that guy, with the aquacross guy because he didn't have anybody else to go out there and do it with. And it was cool because by the end of it, and I, look, I'm a jet ski guy. I grew up racing motocross. Of course, at one point, I'm sure I won the transition into racing jet skis, and I never did it. And I appreciate, you know, what they had to go through. But it was just cool to see the, the different discipline and, and, and how things are working. And, you know, you're right. I've been doing this for 20 years. I can see, you know, I can see what a boat's going to do before it even happens. And even driving pleasure boats, I mean, I can feel what boats do differently than the people that drive the boats know what they're doing, you know. So it's just it, again, it's an all, it's a feel thing, right. uh, it's a vision thing, it's what you're used to, it's what you get to do. Obviously, your your sport is so much faster and intense um, because of how small it is and right. how fast the boats go in such a small area. You know, we get really stretched out, we get going real far away from each other. You know, I told you earlier, some of these boats can stretch out a pretty big lead uh, over the course of the race. Right. You know, it's. Not as so easy for your guys to do that, especially like a little triangular course like we have here in the harbor and in, 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 in Wisconsin. Yeah, it's going to be inter- interesting, uh, uh, especially the different setup with this three-pin course. Normally we're running four to six pins. Uh, but, yeah, you know, I mean, those first handful of laps, a guy can stretch out a lead. But the problem is we run, you know, anywhere between 18 and 25 guys in, in, in our main events. So when you've got 25 boats on a three-quarter to a one-mile course – you may get a few laps of clean water, but eventually you start jumping into those back markers, right. and that's really what is the really probably the linchpin dynamic yep. in our type of racing is once those guys have to start going to lane five because there's three sl- slower boats that are going to be in the middle of the turn when they get there, now that guy that's behind him is catching up because he's slowing down. He's able to go inside, and it really creates a lot of, of great competition a lot of times in most of our races, we'll have guys going three, four wide for seventh, eighth, ninth place. Uh, so it's a bit different, but we also aren't running at 150, 160 plus miles an hour right. like you guys are. Right. What were your, what speeds will your boat see out, see out here on this course today? Yeah, I, I would say we're probably, you know, today, 50, if they're lucky, because they don't well, want to destroy t- the mean, boat. Today, <laughs> but mean, tomorrow we get the wind out of the west like we're hoping, and it lays thing down here in the harbor. As long as we can keep the swells down, you'll probably see these APX 200s top out at about 115 miles an hour, maybe 120 if they really get a roll. And the tricky part here is they don't have a big, long straightaway. Right. right? A lot of times we'll give them at least one to let them eat. Yep. Um, but here, it, w- based on the design, right, the space we had inside the harbor, we had to go three pins. So you're probably, like you talked about today with your guys tomorrow, we're probably going to see guys with punch props, right? Yep. Small little All punch props trying to get as much acceleration, which is much more difficult with the APX and that four-stroke than they're used to. It's a different animal, but uh, which I like to see. Uh, we're probably going to see the 93 of RJ West, uh, who's out of Manteca, California. He was the first guy to get an APX. He's been running his second full season in the APX. He's the only guy to run one last year. Well, a couple of guys run him last year, but the most successful of them, uh, as well as the 190 of Dustin Terry. And that's a great boat. If you remember back in the day of the Mercury Racing Factory team, Billy, his boat is designed like Billy Siebold's 
uh, like Billy Siebold's original Mercury Racing Formula One tunnel hall that he won like everything with. But it looks like we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back with Class One qualifying here at the 2023 Midwest Mercury Challenge downtown Sheboygan, Wisconsin. If you own a home or business, it might surprise you to see what is not covered in your insurance policy. There are gaps and exclusions in primary and umbrella policies that make you a target if an incident or claim occurs and you don't have the right coverage in place. And that's why you need a true umbrella policy from X Insurance. There are 40 million lawsuits filed every year in the USA. Let's get that target off your back. Welcome back to the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge coming to you live from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We are waiting to get Class 1 qualifying underway. Uh, pothole heroes Johnny and Carlos have been idling out in the harbor uh, for quite some time. You can still see the uh, M -Con, Monster Energy MCON boys. Of course, Monster Energy, the official energy drink of P1 Offshore Racing. Uh, they are still hanging out on the deck of their boat trying to get everything figured out. We are waiting for a pace boat. Uh, now, I did get a text during the commercial break saying, why do we need a pace boat if we're doing qualifying? Because they're going to do a parade lap prior to their qualifying run. The reason is, is they didn't, everybody did not get to go out and test. They went out and ran around the course, but they only ran maybe a lap, maybe a lap and a half uh, before they came back in to make adjustments or changes. So not everybody got to see the cold course run a couple of laps on it. So they're going to go out. They'll do one parade lap. Once the parade lap is complete, then we will start with our qualifying. Of course, the fastest qualifier today will take the pole position for tomorrow and Sunday's race here in Sheboygan. Wisconsin. How do you guys determine who starts where? So we used to be a single lap qualifying pole position format. Uh, six years ago with the invention of the Formula One Powerboat Series, uh, kind of the, the brainchild of John Schubert and Tim Siebold. Tim Siebold, uh, decorated tunnel boat racer uh, and youngest son of Bill Siebold. That's uh, who I did the last lotto in 2019 when I was at lotto. I did it with Bill Siebold. I'll never forget it was Bill Siebold because Dave Scott showed up and we were all sitting there chit-chatting having a great time. That's Yeah, you, hey, you get some great stories out of Bill from all those decades oh, yeah. of, you know, Malaysia and Europe oh, yeah. and, and the, I mean, the Bahamas. Um, you know, my, my, I, I was lucky enough to grow up in the sport, right? My, my father was an announcer for yep. 25 years, so I'm a second-generation Formula One powerboat race announcer, if that's an actual thing. I so, guess it is now. Well, so you say that, I mean, there are a couple of things. I, I think about a lot of things when I'm not doing this and thinking about this. So I have a six-year-old son, my son Connor, back home with my wife. And, I, you know, you told me that yesterday on the phone. I thought to myself, man, I need to aspire to get my kid to pick up and do this like I'm doing it. And I, nah, well, wait a minute. Nah, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll get him to do it. Maybe <laughs> I won't. Well, I can tell you the easiest way to get him to want to do it when he's an adult is drag him to every race you possibly can and park him right next to wherever you are on the judges' stand. That'll help him. And that's how I was yeah. able to do it. Right, right now he's like, I'm bored. I'm leaving. I'm done. Yeah. I sponged it all in. You know, I was able I, – I was very lucky, right? I was able to be immersed with all the teams yep. as a kid. I knew everybody. I understood what was going on. Um, and it allowed me to appreciate and enjoy – uh, the, the nuance uh, and everything that went on within uh, tunnel boat racing. But uh, glad that you got to hang out with Billy in 2019. Yeah. Uh, he's a great guy to, to be on the mic with. I've been able to be on the mic with Mil Billy a couple of times. We were actually announcing differently that same weekend. You had Billy on the mic with you all weekend. I was down doing our live stream for just the Formula One oh, series. Oh, I remember that. That's yeah. right. I do remember that. Yeah, we didn't combine them. We were down. I was down on that old cement. It uh, looked like it was an old pier built right yep. by the bridge there, yep. right by Neon Taco. Yep. And we were just under a couple of tents yep. and doing our thing. I remember and, that. that. And Billy was, was with you guys doing your thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that was really – I think because of events like that, it spurred things 
like what we're doing here right. today, right? Really more of this bringing together. And it sounds like in the future, this may not be the last time that we see offshore and the tunnel boat disciplines within the American Power Boat Association merge and have those co-events. All right, so I think we've gotten the pace boat cigarette situation figured out. Uh, I think the MCON uh, cigarette center console, uh, probably Shane Sherman driving that boat, is now going to be the pace boat. I see a yellow flag on a beautifully painted black, red, and white uh, cigarette. They have a yellow flag, so I think now they're going to be the pace boat. I don't know if they ever got the issue that they had resolved or not, but uh, Pothole Heroes has now come out. DF Young is starting to come out, so Husky Ice Spritz is pulling off the dock. So it looks like uh, after about almost just about an hour or half hour delay, we are going to start to get qualifying underway. Remember, they will run one, run one full parade lap, uh, get to see the course, and then they will start their two-lap qualifying runs. And it will be two laps, two laps only. There is no third lap option, so you have to do your best you can. Uh, but as I said earlier, and especially to you, Thomas, uh, conditions are going to change 110% for tomorrow. This is, I, I do not see the conditions being like this tomorrow. Yeah, now the question is, is will the class guys, one guys, have a chance, opportunity to go out and test tomorrow morning before they run their main event? Because I have a feeling you're going to see some pretty hefty setup changes from today to tomorrow if the wind does what we expect it to. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it's hard to say. We have a pretty full day tomorrow between yeah, the, the F1 races, the offshore races, but then uh, Sheboygan has done a great job filling it in with all kinds of different activities. Uh, there's some military demonstrations going on. Uh, when I came over here from the pits, there's like three or five or six big uh military utility vehicles over there with boats stacked up on the back of them and stuff. So I guess that's going to be a whole bunch of different things happening there. So we've got a pretty packed schedule. I don't know if they'll get to go out and test, um, you know, but these guys are fairly confident in their calm water setup, their flat water setup, uh, because in this day and a of racing, you know, unfortunately we race a lot more calm water races than we do rough water races. Uh, you know, it was rough in Michigan City last weekend, but Sarasota uh, was completely flat. Uh, by the time the Class 1 race happened, Cocoa Beach was uh, the uh, – Cocoa Beach was completely flat, which is abnormal. That's usually one of our roughest races of the year. So, you know, it's pretty safe to say that these teams are probably really good in their flat water setup. Uh, and I'm not saying they're not good in their rough water setup, but they're probably much more versed on being able to figure out their flat water setup over their rough water setup. If it flattens out for tomorrow, uh, you know, there's not much humidity up here. The air is pretty, the air is not very thick. Um, so they're going to be pretty comfortable with everything they need to do to map the engine, set the engines up, gearing, props, uh, you know, a lot of different things. These boats have different uh, interchangeable gear ratios, so they can go in and, and make the gear ratio is taller or shorter, you know, based for acceleration. They're, they're, they don't have the expansive choice of props that, like, say, Supercat has or even Super Stock or even the 450 class. That's one of the rules. But they do have a bunch of different gear ratios they can change to basically achieve the same, same thing when you change either your diameter prop or your pitch of your prop or, or anything of that nature. Interesting. So is Class 1 a single prop class? No, it's not single prop. No, no, no. They've got they've got props, and I'm not 100% official on the class one rules, and I'm sure I'll hear about that later, or somebody's gonna text me. Um, but I do know that they are they they are limited on running their props. I mean, you talk to MCON, the MCON 750 uh, Supercat team probably has 15 or 16 sets of props. Right. For their for their naturally aspirated 750 horsepower motor boat. Right. I mean, that's just the way that it is. But they they limit it to the class one just to make it a little bit more of a level playing field. Fair. You know, I mean, and that's, and whereas you talk about like limiting props for a level playing field, that's really in, t in our world on the formula one side, especially more today. We've, you know, we've done such a good job of homologating the class and yep. creating different specs for different motor packages. So they're really even. And so the biggest thing that our guys have truly is the prop and the weight distribution that they move around, right? We run 1,250 pounds boat motor driver, right? So that's 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 your minimum weight. And these guys- That's what they have to come out at? Correct, they gotta come out at 1,250 pounds boat motor with the driver in it, minimum weight. So they weight. crane the boat out with the driver in it? Nope, so we pull them out oh, and you then ramp, we Oh, you ramp them out. We ramp them out okay. and then we have a crane set up. So like here, right, tomorrow- You just pick it up, you just pick tomorrow it up. Tomorrow we'll use the offshore cranes to just pick it up off the hook. It'll have a, we'll clip a scale uh, to it. Okay. It'll weigh it, they set it back down and away you go. Okay. If you're, a, you know, a tenth of a pound under, you're booted. You're done. See you later. Yep, okay. So a lot of these guys, especially with these carbon boats now, these carbon boats are naturally coming in with the drivers in 50, 75, 100 pounds underweight because the carbon oh, yeah. is so light these days, which the drivers love because it allows them to move that weight around. And by moving that weight around in the boat, especially with the amount of turning that they do, it really helps change the attitude of the boat. So the weight movement and the propeller is really almost all our guys have to set up for different race courses, or right, or even for the guys that they're racing against, right? If they got a guy on right and left of them that they know are all punch guys, yep. they know they've got to get off the dock. 
and once the, if they can get out in front of them, they can hold them off, right? But if they get behind them, they know those guys are going to drive them all over the course, and they may sit in third all race. They're going to run a wide course. Correct. They're going to run a they're going to run a wide race. They're going to run a defensive race. They're gonna, absolutely. They're going to block them. Yeah, we see a and lot of blocking a, in our series. It's the same thing in offshore power racing when you talk about the weight, right? I mean, everybody's going to the carbon fiber and the super duper light layups, and all the boats are getting built underweight to the fact where they're going to have to add weight in order to be able to make the minimum weight to come out for the class. Not even thinking about fuel. You know, we don't crane out with the drivers. You have to leave all your equipment on the boat. Uh, your life jackets, helmets, all that stuff have to stay on the boat. Just the driver and throttle may get off. You can't touch anything else on the boat. It has to come out. You can't pull the drain plug. Can't do anything. It has to be lifted up and weighed as soon as the race is over. That's how the that's how the rules stated. But you know, a lot of these boats are just getting built so incredibly light, similar to what you have. They have to add weight in order to be able to make it happen. The newest boat here, of course, is uh, Monster Energy MCON. That boat is just about seven months old. Uh, they're still trying to get it figured out. Of course, the X Insurance Good Boy Vodka entry, Randy Kent, Grant Bruggerman. That is a new boat to this team. That is a former Abu Dhabi boat. It's a world championship boat run by Johnny Tomlinson. I believe Gary Ballou uh, ran that boat to that world championship. That's is that a different the boat that Abu Dhabi brought over here? Did they bring it over from, uh, from over there? Because I know they were doing some Class 1 racing. Uh, across the world at one point. At one point, yeah. Team. Victory Team came over here for a couple of years. I don't think Abu Dhabi ever came over. They were talking about it, but I don't think they ever came over. That boat's first race was in Sarasota uh, just over July 4th weekend. That's the only boat that has the Mercury Racing number 6 drive and the rudder. Now, every other boat in the class has a BPM surface drive, so it's a straight shaft right out of the back of the boat. It yep. can just adjust vertically straight up and down. It does not turn, and then they all run a rudder. That's what's on the bus at the back of the boat there with the two rams that come out of right. it. The back of the X insurance boat, though, has two number six drives, okay, that you'd see on a pleasure boat. They have the skegs cut off of the bottom of them, right, and then they have the rudder boat. Now, you talk to Johnny Tomlinson, who is without a doubt the other best throttle man here. Uh, there's lots of best throttle men here, but Johnny Tomlinson, one of the most decorated, he says that's the best turning boat that he has ever driven and I, I you know I really went home and I really thought about it you know in skegs and hydrodynamics and so on and so forth and I went well that makes a lot of sense because those two number sixes are going to act like skegs right when you go around the turn they're just going to help that boat they don't turn but they just help that boat set going around the corner as to where the surface drive it's much thinner it's much higher up out of the water so it doesn't really create that drag uh, going around the corner because when just like your boats you know when you see the F1 boats run they run ag, 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 they're all up you know riding on their tail and they suck it down and they go into a turn they turn yep. well the same thing has to happen here when these boats go down the turn the throttle is going to trim it down trim it down trim it down so the boat sets down in the corner and then they're actually going to turn the wheel if they're going too fast going into the corner and they don't set it they turn the wheel boat's not going to turn there's not enough rudder there's not enough rudder in the in the water to turn and the boat has too much air packed underneath of it right. to set it down to allow it to track through the turn um, so that's critical here to be able to set the turn set the boats going into the corners but Johnny Tomlinson said that number six setup he used to run it with Dave Scott uh, on one of the old Bud Select boats, and he said that that was he loved how that boat turned, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it from a hydrodynamic standpoint. Yeah, you know, it's just like you look at like the unlimited hydroplanes that run that big skid fin, right? Yep. I mean, when you've got that thing holding you in the water, oh, yeah. it holds you in place, it hugs you to the water as long as you can get it down. Now, quick question, right? When our guys don't trim it out, and they try to set it, it'll crank, and we barrel roll, right? We do a lot of barrel rolling yep. as a part of of the accidents that happen in tunnel boat racing. Yep. What happens in a big giant 42 foot, 38 foot offshore boat that flies into the corner, going too hard, too fast, doesn't set it? Will you see them just kind of skid out? More often than not, do they barrel roll? Is that something that happens with your guys? So these boats, what they'll do is they'll go through the turn and they slip, right? If you ever watch NASCAR and you watch NASCAR closely, it doesn't turn up to the wall. It slides up to the wall. I mean, it's a controlled slide up to the wall. Travis was trying to tell you that's one of the hardest things he had to get used to doing was the car sliding towards the wall. And there's not a lot you can do about it. It's just going to get in the groove and stop when you get there. These boats will go into the corner and they will slide. And the most common thing to happen in offshore power racing into a corner is they're going to catch the rear outside corner of the boat as it slides through the corner, right? So if they're turning right, okay, they're turning right on the left side of the boat. That left rear corner, it can catch a wave as it's sliding through, and it just goes up and barrel rolls over just okay. like that. That is most of the time what's going to happen in a turn if a boat's going to go over. Now, you can have a boat roll up on its side, you know, and maybe barrel roll over this way, or barrel roll over that way. I can't think of the last time a Class 1 boat or a, a boat of this size went, you know, up and straight over backwards just because it's – they're really big to make that happen. There were two super stock boats, LPC and Allen Lawn Care Landscaping in Key West, Florida. I'm sure you've seen the videos. They did uh, a simultaneous backflip in Key West, Florida a couple of years ago, which was a pretty amazing thing to see. Uh, 
But these boats, no, if, it, it's more if they just if they go through the turn, they're sliding through the turn, they catch that outside corner, it's just going to roll over and land right, upside so, down. So, so it's, no, it's very similar to what we see, right, is yep. that, that back outside edge will hook, or yep. they'll slide so far that it falls off the backside of a wave and just dips that backside in, and, 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 and just the momentum just takes you right over. Well, and just so people who aren't familiar between some of the differences of F1 and offshore power racing, when you say falls off a wave, it's three inches tall. Right. Right. When I say fall off the waves, it could be four feet tall. Correct. Right? Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure everybody understood uh, the differences there uh, as we get qualifying underway. So this is going to be their parade lap. They're going to go out and run one full lap around the course. There is DF Young, number 17. There is Pothole Heroes. The victory hall, beautiful mystic hall with DF Young. Used to have some big blower motors in it. And Richie Wyatt decided this year to put the Mercury 1100 motors in it and come out and run Class 1. Husky Ice Spritz there. I believe that's 222 offshore just to the right of our screen. Britt Lilly, Steve Curtis in the number one Husky Ice Spritz. Now that used to be the Husky Chocolate Boat, correct? Or that they actually have used to be the Miss Geico Boat. Ah. And then the Miss Geico team um, closed its doors some years ago, and then Husky Chocolate took it over, and then Husky Ice Spritz came out. Husky Ice Spritz is an adult beverage that is in conjunction with Good Boy Vodka. So uh -huh. we could uh, enjoy a few of those libations later this evening as we get to that block party in downtown Sheboygan, and that's Wisconsin. And that's going to be a hoot. Six to ten tonight, they got the streets blocked off. We're going to have the F1 boats, all the offshore boats on their tilt trailers oh down. Yeah. We're going to have live music. So if you're, if you're watching this and you're near, right? If you're in yep. Milwaukee, if you're over in Green Bay, if you're in Oshkosh, get in the car, get down here. Uh, we just got this one class one uh, qualifying today, but boy, the party tonight's going to be off the chain. I think it's going to. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And it was such an easy drive uh, from Milwaukee. I got in the car, set the GPS. It was like, man, fifty-eight minutes. I was like, ah, okay, no problem. That's not bad because I have a five twenty flight out of uh, Milwaukee on Monday morning. So uh, I'm glad <laughs> it's only going to be an hour drive at whatever uh. time. It's funny in Cocoa Beach. I had a similar flight to come home from Cocoa Beach, and I was hanging out with Britt Lilly and, and Kevin Smith and everybody. And they were like, "Hey, we're going to go over to this bar and hang out and go. You want to go?" And I'm like. Oh man, I'm like, I yeah, I'd, 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 like I'd love to go, but I gotta go to bed and I gotta go to work, and I didn't go. And come to find out, I think they went home at three o'clock in the morning from that bar. So I was like, yeah, mm, kind of glad I didn't make that happen. Fair, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's you know they're not they can't necessarily party as hard as they want to during the weekend. Oh, I, so when I the race weekend it. gets over. They all let loose. I fully admit, man. I, I, it, you know, if I go out and really tie one on and have a good time, mm, it, it takes me days to recover. It's 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 bad news bears now. Yeah, man. It happens. The older you get, the longer it takes. It seems. But uh, ah, well, that's there, a, that's yeah, there's beautiful the beautiful boat. cigarette pace boat, owned by Tyler and Lindsey Miller of the Monster Energy MCon team. Of course, they are the two boat team running Class One and Super Cat. Super Cat boat went home this weekend, and they only brought their brand new black skater hull MCon Monster Energy. Monster Energy Drink, the official energy drink of P1 Offshore Racing. We have our Monster Energy straightaway this weekend. That will be the straight right in front of the power plant uh, down to the beach here at the Bay Harbor Hotel, which has uh, been nice enough to host us in their front yard. Uh, basically, we've got a little raindrop out here right now, a little bit of a rain come down. Uh, I did see some darker clouds pass over, so uh, nothing to really worry about. Sun's still shining. It's still going to get this qualifying underway as they will come around and complete their parade lap. So they complete the parade lap. Where does everybody else hang out while the first boat's running its two hard laps on the course by itself? That's the one thing I didn't hear is where they're going to start from. So the other boats are just going to mill. They're just, they'll just sit there in a, in a circle and just mill around. Um, I, I just don't know where they're going to start from. And we'll be interesting to see where they come off a plane. They're obviously running back uh, up towards us. This is up Lake Michigan running north now between turns 10 and 1. So they are on the Monster Energy straightaway for the first time here for the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge. Good shot. Now tomorrow, when you see this particular shot and these boats are running flat water, you'll see daylight right under those tunnels. You'll see right all the way out of the back of the boat. Oh, yeah. That means the boat's running good, flying high. I imagine you can see the same thing. Uh, a little bit smaller of a hole there to look through in the F1 boats, but you can probably still see the light. Yeah, you know, I mean, our, our boats are, you know, 16 and a half to 17 and a half feet long. Uh, at full power, you're probably going to only have about the back two and a half feet of the of the sponsons or the pads yep. in the water, and it's just packing air in that tunnel, lifting it up out of the water, right, trying to increase that drag coefficient. Try to make doing a drag coefficient better, so they just get. That's where your speed comes from, right? Yep. You don't have four wheels. You don't have uh, a, a stable uh, surface underneath you. So you've got to find other ways to increase your speed. And when it comes to boats, it's all about just getting as much of the dang thing out of the water as right. humanly possible while leaving the prop in. Exactly. And I I wreck it. I I. I Describe this as being like the wing of an airplane. This boat is just designed to lift, 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 just to get as much of it out of the water as you possibly can. Obviously, a little bit more than the two to three inches of the uh, back of the boat running in the water, but, you know, maybe a few feet 
uh, when the boats are running their best. Of course, we wouldn't see that today. Uh, we're not going to see that today because it is pretty rough out here. And you can kind of get an idea by that shot exactly how rough it is uh, as they drop down in some of these holes. But a beautiful day here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. There is 222 Offshore Husky Ice Spritz. X Insurance Good Boy Vodka. We saw DF Young in that group. 222 Offshore Australian Navy. Darren Nicholson and Giovanni Carpatella will be starting our qualifying session off, running their two laps to figure out who runs the polls tomorrow. And this has got to be a big weekend uh, for the folks in 222 Offshore Australian Navy. Five-point lead coming in over Husky Ice in the Class 1 uh, World Championship standings with a two-race weekend. This could be this could be their separator, yep. or this could be their demise, right? Depending on how things go. So I know they're probably going to have a lot of weight on their shoulders, a lot of pressure on that team to really come out and try to bridge that gap. Because you look at them sitting at 55 points, Husky Ice sitting at 50. Then a big gap down to Pothole Heroes at 21. However, one or two, a couple of things happen. You can see Pothole Heroes with a couple back-to-back -back oh, wins, yeah. and it completely changes the landscape of the Class One World Championship here in 2023. Well, the thing to think about with the 222 Offshore Australia Navy boat is, so Darren's from Australia, Giovanni's from, Ita from Italy, okay? And they come over about a week before the race. The boat sits down on the, um, the east coast of Florida. That's where it gets stored in a building down there. They come over about a week prior. They go through the boat. They get it ready. They go racing. They take the boat home. They close it up, put it away, fly home, and they come back and do the next one. This is one of the only races that I'm aware of that's going to be back-to-back. -back. So they were in Michigan City last weekend. They got to stay with the boat all week. Uh, they probably got to perform a lot more maintenance on the boat, got yeah. to check a lot more things on the boat. So I think that would probably really help their confidence, if you would, because sure. they got to stay with the boat for a whole week rather than leaving it for, you know, up until Michigan City last weekend. They hadn't seen the boat since July 4th weekend. Right. You know, so... You know, you got to get everything fixed and everything put back together, and you're going back. Of course, Darren Nicholson runs 222, I think it's 222 Marina, uh, which is a marine service facility down in Australia. Of course, we have a lot of racers from coming over, you know, a lot of uh, some racers come over from Australia. We've got some from New Zealand. Of course, Wayne Valder runs Pro Floors Valder Yachts in the Supercat class. He comes all the way from New Zealand. So, quite a dynamic uh, group here in this. You've got Steve Curtis, you've got, the, uh, you've got Giovanni, you've got Darren. Uh, you've got Billy Moore. Let's talk about Billy Moore and Team DeFalco. This is going to be his second weekend in the boat with Mike Falco. The only outer limits out here on the class. Uh, of course, Billy Moore taking over for Chris Hanley, who was throttling that boat at the beginning of the year. Uh, Billy Moore, his father started, Bobby Moore, started the throttle man position. He was the one that came up with the idea back in the day is, hey, how come somebody uh, throttles, how, let's have somebody throttle the boat and let's have somebody drive the boat, okay? And I go to boat shows and I talk about boat racing, obviously, just like you said, quite a bit, sometimes more than I probably want to yeah. uh, on any given weekend. But everybody always asks me, why a throttle man and a driver? You just took the words out of my mouth. And how does it work, okay? And this is what I tell everybody. Go get your wife with your car. You give it the gas, and she turns the wheel and tell me if you make it home. The reason that we do it, I mean, but it's a good way to reference it, right? Because you have to have that much trust in the person that's For giving sure. the boat the gas that they're going to be able to trust what you're doing. Um, the reason is, is there's so much happening in these boats when you're coming out of the water. You know, you're trimming it. You've got your drives. You've got your tabs. You've got your tunnel tabs. Some boats run ballast, right? The throttle man is in charge of all that. He's in charge of the gauges. He's in charge of how the boat's running, the attitude of the boat, what it's doing, so on and so forth. The driver is simply watching where the boat is going and picking, it, picking his reference points on land so he knows where to go. Back in the day, these boats would run across Lake Michigan here, and they didn't have GPS. So they back in the day, they had a navigator, and the navigator would say, okay, we're going to run 38 degrees west. That's how we know we're going to get to our next turn. Um, so that the responsibilities used to divide up that way. Of course, navigators know more. We've got computers and GPSs, and we run much smaller courses now than what we used to. Um, but the throttleman's job inside the boat, it's 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 – it's weird how it works. If you watch Bob Teague and Paul Whittier, of course, Paul, everybody knows Bob Teague from Teague Custom Marine out in California. I hope he's listening. Um, Bob Teague, an another great throttleman, been racing since the 70s, a very good friend of mine. If you watch him race with Paul Whittier, they'll actually get into a straightaway, and Paul will take his hands off the wheel. Now, I'm not saying he takes his hands like puts him down to his side, but he'll release his grip, and he keeps his hands just on the outside of the steering wheel because Bob doesn't want him turning that wheel any going down a straightaway because the moment you turn it, you're turning the drives, and you're called dragging, you scrub all speed. Right. And then Bob will tell you when he goes into the turn, then it's Paul's boat. Paul's job is to get it through the turns. But as soon as he gets on the straightaways, Bob is going to start trimming the drives up. He's going to get the boat to fly where he wants it. And Bob and, and a lot of throttlemen will actually kind of steer the boat just a little bit with the throttles. They can give one motor a little bit more gas than the other one and, and get it to creep around a little bit if they can even do it. Sometimes they're wide open and they can't do that. Right. But it's a very dynamic relationship. I've done both jobs. I've throttled boats and I've driven boats. Um, you can probably pretty much throttle a boat 
with anybody up to a certain speed, you know, because you can kind of coach them along through doing it. But once it gets to that speed, the driver needs to think fast enough for themselves to know what the boat's going to do that, you know, the throttleman won't have time to tell them. So, so is that when you see like a driver, let's say you got a driver that's running a bracket class, right? And chooses to move up to, to one of those classes that has more of the dual will you see them start off in the driver position or the throttleman position it it all depends it depends it, it, it and you say bracket class that's such a completely different animal for throttleman like you know it's you know because bracket class they're limited to their speed you right. know the class that i used to run was class six you only 70 miles an hour i never forget we went out testing in the boat that i ran and i throttle it and the throttle man drove the boat and he he punches me and he says hey look you're at 78 miles an hour it's like oh sorry forgot gotta only go 70 you know so it you know, your boat can go faster than that, but you have to stop at that speed rack. You cannot go any faster yeah, than you that. You break out, you're done. Exactly. And it, it takes discipline. It takes a tremendous amount of discipline to do that. And guys that are used to running boats wide open to jump back down to that, it's probably fairly difficult to do. I, I would at least think it is. And it's probably difficult for a guy to come from a back class into a wide open boat race because they're just not used to being able to just hold it for as long as you can to go as, as fast as you can. Um, but a good throttleman can do it. A good driver can do it. The, the good ones, a lot of them won't communicate. A lot of them don't talk unless they absolutely need to. Um, you know, they will they can anticipate each other's moves. Like Bob Bob, Bob Teague and Paul Whittier, you know, I, I remember them not talking very much, you know, because they kind of anticipated what the boat was going to do, and they were just very disciplined in what they did. Uh, you know, a guy like Johnny Tomlinson, very cool, very calm, and collecting the boat, able to coach you through running it. Of course, Johnny Tomlinson is going to run with Taylor Sism tomorrow yep. uh, in the Marine Technologies 450 factory stock class race. And she's really, boy, that, that team has really ratcheted things up. I mean, I think the first time that debuted was back at Lodo in 2019. She ran an exhibi they ran an exhibition run in that uh, in that 450 well, RMTI. Yeah, yeah, well, in 2019, it was an exhibition class. They weren't yeah. allowed to score any points or any championship points because they didn't have enough boats in the class. Right. APBA rules state you have to have three boats in the class and they be able to score points, and she was the first one that came out. You know, uh, she went to Randy, and it was funny. I saw an interview on YouTube about this the other day. She went to Randy and, and wanted to go racing, and, and they came up with the 450 stock class. They worked with OPA. They worked with P1. They were really able to incorporate it. I really like the class. I really like how introductory it is because super stock – has become so competitive yeah. that if you're not if you're not in a brand new good fast boat, unfortunately you may not just be a competitive team. I mean that's just that's just the way that it is in super stock. It's just become that big. I think 450 is a good way for people to get into it. You know, it's a completely stock motor, it's a completely stock program. Right. You know, it's a it's a boat that has to be built out of a production mold. It cannot be a one-off boat. So the 39 MTI, for example, it's the same 39 MTI Correct. that. Uh, the green one that runs at Lotto, um, I can't remember the name of it right now, but that, that's a 39. See, that's the same boat as Taylor's. Right. There's a red one that runs at Lotto. It's the same boat as Taylor's. It's a production-based boat, and they have to be uh, per the rules of the class. But that class is really starting to grow, really starting to bring some people into it. Uh, of course, the number five boat, which we'll see out here tomorrow, I don't remember the name of it. They're a brand-new team, Sean Torrente, running in that boat. Uh, so it'll be interesting yeah, to see Yeah, doing double duty run. this weekend, uh, well, Sean J is. Yeah, Sean's doing double duty. Johnny Tomlinson will do double duty. Billy Moore normally does double duty, but he won't be doing it this weekend as his Super Cat team, Graydell, is not here with us, but I believe it's F. It's going to be the number five. Yeah, it's the yeah. F5 MFR Racing. Uh, Caleb Mead and, uh, is, and is driving Tarente, that boat. Yep. Sean, Sean throttling it. You know, it's it's interesting. You, know, you talk about a guy like Sean Tarante, somebody I've known my entire life, right? I watched him come up the ranks from, from Formula Lights, formerly called SST45, running a, running a, running a two-cylinder – <laughs> right, forty-five, right, forty-five cubic inch OMC from the you know that was built brand new in the late sixties or early seventies. My buddy still runs that class. Oh, who's that? Mike Harris. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mike, uh, Mike was actually just down in uh, Ravenswood, West Virginia. Yep. Mike Harris uh, was my childhood, fr my childhood friend growing up. Mike Harris. Uh, great guy, man. Uh, yep. I love the team. I, I had a chance to hang out with Mike and the team um, in West Virginia yep. a couple years ago when I did an APR race down there for uh, APR Super League race for Sam and Sharon Weiner. Uh, great folks, you know, it's a real bummer that there isn't more uh, racers in his classes. Well, out that there class in the suffered Northeast. a big division, a, a big kind of breakup too, right? I mean, they, they, because they were kind of doing, like, doing their own races or something, and then the guy that was doing it or producing it or something, he kind of like went his own way. Or I knew well, that there was happened, something that happened. What, what happened was is uh, is Fred Miller, who uh, was the was the kind of ran the Formula Lights class. Fred unfortunately passed away. Oh, and, and okay. Fred was the glue that kept that together. We'd see eighteen to twenty five boats any given weekend at a race. And, and yeah, it has. And I've watched his off. races. It's super competitive. Unfortunately, I've not been to one, but I've watched his races. All right, we have got qualifying underway in Class One. This is two 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 offshore Australian Navy. So they are going to start on the south end of the course. That's down towards Chicago and Milwaukee. They will run up towards the start finish line, marker number ten to marker number one. The Monster Energy straight 
straightaway, and that's where their time will begin, and they will run two laps to qualify, and then Husky Ice Brits will take to the course as Husky Ice Brits idles around now. So not quite up to speed yet. I'm very interested, Thomas, though, to see how fast these boats go, to see if they run on a more conservative setup, try and save the equipment. You know, I know Gary Stray, the crew chief for Husky Ice Spritz, uh, Gene Gruber, the uh, the crew chief for X Insurance Good Boy Vodka, they're going to be reporting back their times, you know, of right. what they're recording. Now, they may not be exactly what... Uh, what P1 and Class 1 are recording, but, you know, they're going to be close enough to know where they stand compared to other boats. But you can see a lot of air there. Uh, 222 looks really good. Giovanni and Darren have that boat dialed in, running flat. Of course, they are your winners in Michigan City. They like the rough water. Uh, they won in Michigan City last year, and they enjoyed the rough water there, too. So this is a good <coughs> rough water team, good rough water setup. I'm, I'm excited to see what they can do. Yeah, it looks like, uh, you know, and, and they're going to really have to lay the hammer down because they don't have anybody that they're chasing, yep. right? Typically... Uh, in, in, from what I'm used to, I'm seeing the guy who's the fastest go last, right? Right. Now they have to go first. So, you know, they very well could set a time that's tough for anybody else to beat because they're really going to have to run it on the ragged edge because they have to wait to see what everybody else is going to do behind them. Yep. And the last thing they want to do is not start on the inside of lane one tomorrow. Exactly. A lot of air underneath this boat. They went across the start finish line. This is marker number Woo. one, big hop there uh, by 222 offshore. Looking good, though. They dive into the turn. This is a four-pin turn. One, two, three, and four all the way back to head south, back towards Milwaukee. Look at the boat flatten out going through the turns, though. Now they're running in the trough, right? They're going to settle a little bit down. The waves are going to come out their side. They're going to roll around more left to right, port to starboard, as they go around this turn. But as soon as they exit pin number three to pin number four, they're going to start hitting that chop. You'll start to see some air again, and then when they hit number four, they're just going to be going straight back into it. And you can see right there, there's the air starting to pick back up. You see they have to slow down and kind of set the boat get to pin number four, and then they will head south. This is lap number one for 222 offshore in Class 1 qualifying. Now, Australian Navy on the side. Uh, it's interesting to see how big of a lead they have and the position that they're in. What do you think is going to come out? Do you, could you see really the 222 offshore put a stranglehold on the Class 1 World Championship when we leave the Mercury Midwest Challenge here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin? Yeah, Sunday I think so. Afternoon? You know, uh, offshore powerboat racing is a race of attrition. you got to finish to win it. Just like your boat races, you got to finish to win it. Something could break. Uh, they have become very consistent running. Uh, they've gotten good. They've gotten these Mercury Racing 1100s dialed in. Uh, they've gotten that victory hull dialed in. And... Uh, you know, they know what to do. Big hop there. They're really running. I'm quite surprised. They're really running pretty bow down. Uh, not a scary bow down, but you can see on some of these hops that the, the bow is actually breaking a lot further forward uh, than I would have anticipated. But you can hear up oh, as we have Husky Ice Brits now taking to the course. Okay, so they're going to kind of run them back to back uh, to speed up qualifying just a little bit. So Husky Ice Brits, Britt Lilly, Steve Curtis, they start their qualifying lap in the red and white number one victory hall here. A little backfire pop there uh, coming out of the turbos. Meanwhile, 222 Offshore Australian Navy, they are on the south end of the course. They will come through that turn, come up across the start-finish line, complete lap number one, and start lap number two of qualifying. And, Thomas, as we look south, I do see some rain. I do not, you know, it's really hard to tell from our vantage point, but it could be raining on the south end of this course right now. Yeah, it could. Now, you talked about how you surprised you were with that flat attitude on the boat of the 222 Offshore Australian Navy. Is that because of the risk that it poses with these larger waves and this rough water of that front just bashing in and casing into a wave? No, I don't think so. I just think it's I just think it's how they're running the boat. I think they feel comfortable with running the boat. They don't want to kite it up too much. You know, it's just like dirt bike racing. If your tires are off the ground, you're not going to be going fast, right? right? You're not making forward progress. So when those props leave the water and those boats go up in the air, they're not moving forward. So they want to get the boat sucked back down to the water as they can. Obviously, they're very comfortable with a, with a pretty weight-forward setup. Um, I would figure it's not a real neutral setup. So a neutral setup to me on that boat would be right around where the N or the uh, A are in Navy. To me, that would be their neutral setup. So they've probably got the weight, you know, a couple feet further forward to that, maybe be right at the end of the, the beginning of the cockpit there to get their weight a little bit forward to get that boat to run level. Again, they do not want to wheelie up, but you can see, I mean, it, it's running super flat. Uh, they got both steps out of the water nicely. They're not taking too many really big flyers, which kind of surprises me. It, it seems like they jumped around a little bit more on their first lap, but they will complete lap number one this time by and start lap number two. We do have boat number one, Husky Ice Spritz, now headed towards the south end of the course. It'll be This is a good uh, thing for you to watch too, Thomas, to see where these boats are going to go faster and slower based upon the conditions. Some guys might like to run into it and uh, get the wind to lift the boat a little bit. Some guys might like running with a trailing sea uh, and be able to carry the speed a little bit more over the waves. Absolutely. We see the same thing in Formula One, and a lot of it's indicative of how the bot out of the body of water is acting based on where the wind is, right? If the wind's pushing the water a certain direction, you may not, you may not want to go yep. all out with it behind you. And conversely, right, especially with ours, a lot of times the guys will back up with the wind into them because – you have a 17-foot boat right. into the wind. That weighs 1,000 pounds. Right, and, and we, we see them uh, end up on their heads quite frequently when they push a little too hard into the wind. 
222 Offshore Australian Navy starts their second lap of qualifying. Husby Ice Spritz just behind them coming out of that south turn. They come into turn number one. Beautiful blue hauled boat. Of course, Australian Navy, awesome to have them as a sponsor over here racing in class one in the United States of America. Of course, offshore power racing, very big in Australia too. Darren Correct. races over there and has boats over there and runs his 222 offshore over there in Australia, which it's is It's amazing how many similarities you yep. see in the powerboat racing world across all disciplines yep. between Australia and the United States. They run, you know, your your hydroplanes, right? Your big five liters, your big big block Chevy hydroplanes. Yep. They run tunnel boats. They yep. run offshore boats. What do we run I don't here? Think, the only thing that I don't think the only thing I don't think they do overseas a lot of is drag boats. Like the big top fuel drag boats. Like you don't Fair. see a lot of that yes. over there. I think but you don't see a lot of you, yeah, but you don't see a lot of drag racing like top fuel drag racing cars over there either. I know they drag race, but they don't run like the top alcohol, right. the funny cars and the top fuel dragsters and stuff. So that may be maybe some sort of a reason for that. Of course they do a lot more road racing and car racing over there. So a little bit different than what we see here in the States. Now, 222 Offshore is now running back into the breeze, back into the top, halfway around their second lap of qualifying. Husky Ice Spritz comes across to finish their first lap of qualifying. Hopefully we can get some times posted here and see how these two boats compare. These are your top two boats in Class 1 right now, 1 and 2 in points with Pothole Heroes in third. So what will happen is as... 222 Offshore comes around the south turn and comes around pin number 10. Pothole Heroes will come up on Fall a plane, and them. they will come up behind them. And by the time they get up to speed, uh, then 222 Offshore will pull off to the inside and conclude their qualifying session. And you can hear them really laying off that throttle as they're yep. turning here. Things getting a little bit rough in the corner here at the north end of the course. Yeah, just a little bit. And the boats, like I said, the boats now walk inside to side, left to right, port to starboard uh, more than it is on the straightaway. So now you're kind of getting one prop that may come out of the water a little bit more than the other prop because it's not flying completely straight. So they're having to kind of throttle around uh, just a little just a little bit different of a throttle approach probably in these corners as we see 222 offshore. So I can look to my right and I can barely see the rooster tail. So we can almost see the entire course here. and We haven't even uh, lifted our uh, our hoist up yet maybe a little bit breezier the higher we get yeah and i'm very curious to see how it, if that storm at all is causing any havoc down there on the south end of the course obviously you get some of these rains it's going to change the attitude of the water it's going to decrease your visibility which you know the last thing you need is decreased visibility when you're trying to navigate some fairly large waves here on this rough and tumble uh lake michigan here on the western shores as we've got some unique southeasterly winds that i can tell you we were talking about earlier Living in Minnesota, 95% of the storms, they hit us in Minnesota, <laughs> yep. and then they hit Wisconsin. Yep. Rarely do we see something hit Wisconsin that it makes its way to Minnesota, although with the wind we have today, that's exactly what would happen with some of these storms rolling through. They're going to make their way from west, so from east to west, which is very unique. Right. Eric Colby, the reporter for Speed on the Water, the offshore reporter for Speed on the Water, sent me a text, and it's an interesting point. You know, as we talk about these Mercury Racing Twin Turbo 1100 uh, yeah. racing Mercury engines, I forgot, they do speed water skiing in Australia and they run these like 22 to 23 foot boats with Mercury Racing 1100 or 1350s or whatever they are, twin turbo motors. You see those videos, that's some pretty crazy stuff because they come flying around the corners. I think they use like 300 foot ski, like ski ropes or something. They're so far behind yeah, the boat. Yeah, it's crazy. You see a little bit of that uh, that skiing stuff out in, uh, on the west coast in California. Yep. Uh, God rest his soul, we just lost him. Greg Foster a couple of weeks ago, one of the most phenomenal tunnel boat racers to ever get behind the wheel, but also a competition ski racer. Can you imagine skiing at 120 plus miles an hour? That's rough. We can see we got a three minute, 45 second, 0.12 on the other Australian 222. It looks like Husky Ice after their first lap. What is a little over five seconds behind? About five seconds behind. It'd be interesting to see if they can pick it up. Uh, they're completing their second lap now. So it looks like kind of surprised to see that out of, of Britt and Steve to be five seconds off. That's that's a pretty big gap. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this pans out towards qualifying. Like you said. You know, these are the turf first two boats. They've kind of set the standard, right? Their teams are listening to the broadcast, and they just heard us say 345 uh, for the poll. So now it's kind of given uh, a set the bar for these teams to go out and try and reach. 222 Offshore, Australian Navy, they will pull back into the pits. Husky Ice Brits will come across the start-finish line for the last time. That will complete their qualifying run, and then we will see Pothole Heroes up next. And after Pothole Heroes, we will have the fourth-place boat of D.F. Young. Young. The DF Young, the 50. Yeah, it was surprising to see the Husky Ice Spritz jumped on after lap one. You know, they were kind of on opposite ends of the course. We did not see Pothole Heroes come out after Husky Ice Spritz first lap. Hopefully, we see it come well, out here. Well, otherwise. that's because 222, by the time they complete their first lap, 222, remember, was going around to complete their second lap. So they yeah. had they got to get the boat across the start finish line before they can start the other ones up. They don't want, they don't want to bottleneck anybody up. 
So but to, but I, it looks like I can see a boat coming up on plane on the south end of the course. So that there we go. Be it looks like they here. knocked it down to a 4.63 seconds off that pace set by 222. Again, from, from your saying, right, I don't have much context, and this sounds like you're surprised with that big of a gap. Could that storm rolling in on the south car, part, end of the course played a little bit of part of that? Uh, maybe. Uh, it just it could have been a comfort level thing on the course. It's pretty it's – pretty Diverse water out here right now, as you saw with the boats coming into the corners. Remember, conditions are going to change completely for tomorrow, so this is kind of hard to judge anything that you're going to race in for the next two days because I think it's going to lay down. Four seconds is not that bad. Uh, you know, I, I say that that's I'm, an I'm, eternity in time. I, I know, but I, and I say I'm disappointed, <laughs> and I'm sure that the Husky Ice Bridge team will get all over me later when I see them. It's not, I mean, it's not a bad run um, by any means. I mean, they're four seconds off. These are the top two boats, 345 to, you know, to about a 349. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what the rest of these boats can do. I'm really interested to see what Pothole Heroes can do because that should be um, – that it, it's virtually the same boat as the Husky Ice Spritz boats, a little bit longer. So it would like the rougher water yeah, just a little bit more. Yeah, that definitely going to help. Uh, but this is Carlos's first season running the boat with Johnny Tomlinson on the throttles. So Carlos is still kind of starting to get used to it too. You know, every race he goes to, it's brand new for him. Of course, this is a brand new race site for everybody. Right. But, you know, Carlos is still trying to figure it out. Of course, Carlos has a lot of experience with car racing, but car racing, uh, as Travis Ostrano once told me, completely different than offshore power racing. Now the rain is starting to get just a little bit heavier. Yep. Uh, so I think maybe it is moving this way just a little bit. Well, yeah, it's funny. You know, I, I heard a lot of stories from back in the day, right? And uh, a lot of times they go over to Europe, and they had the two-seater in the Formula One boats. We've got our two-seater ride experience. If you get oh, an yeah, i got to talk to it, somebody about getting yeah, a ride. Talk now. to Tim Siebold. Maybe he'll get you a ride. It's a trip. No, no, no. You're going to hook me up. It's and not they, a maybe. And they, and they put a, a, a – I can't remember who it was, but they put a Formula One – Former world champion from Formula One car racing in a boat. In a boat, and they gave they ripped him around a couple of times. Uh, did three or four laps with him. He got on. He said, "Hey, screw that. Give me breaks." Right. He it just it's a totally different thing. So, as somebody who's had a lot of success in car, they may think that they're going to be uh, jumping and be successful because yep. of that. But it is a completely different animal. I mean, it's it's apples and oranges when you talk cars versus boats when it comes to racing. Well, and I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story as as we watch Pothole Heroes Boat Zero Two Two come across the start finish line on the Monster Straightaway, Monster Energy Drink <laughs> Straightaway. Of course, Monster Energy, the official energy drink of P1 Ultra Racing. Big hop there by Pothole Heroes. Ooh, there's another one. Yeah, they're getting quite a bit of air out there. Got a lot of trim in the boat. And you can see they're carrying the bow a little bit more uh, than 222 offshore was. So a little bit different of a setup for Carlos and Johnny as Pothole Heroes comes around. So we should see DF Young get up on a plane here. And I do see a boat looks like moving down on the south end of the course. So they're going to try and get DF Young running up the start, up the straightaway between 10 and 1 uh, here towards where we're broadcasting from. Raining pretty hard down here now as we are bringing you live coverage of the Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge, beautiful Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Uh, we heard that there could be some rain later today. Try and move some of the equipment out of the rain just a little bit here. In fact, maybe let's try and slide this table back a little bit if we could. There we go. Because it is actually starting to rain pretty good. Now, this can have somewhat of an effect. I've got it as uh, this can have somewhat of an effect on the vision, right? They've got Rain-X on there, and they've got something to be able to uh, to be able to keep the, the the rain off of it. But it will affect, uh, you know, they don't have windshield wipers like a car does, so it will have a somewhat diverse effect on their vision. So DF Young, yep, they are on a plane on the south end of the course. Pothole Heroes is and those about. Those waves are starting to pick up a little bit. Yeah, as the storm rolls. Yeah, the jobs. storm. This is exactly what 222 Offshore was hoping for, right? Hey, let's get our laps in before this storm hits. These waves start to pick up, and uh, and clearly it's showing right now, obviously, with a four, almost a five full second lead over Husky Ice Spritz. I'll be curious to see if uh, Pothole Hero can even hang with Hus Husky Ice Spritz as the storm starts to move in, and just that wind starts to pick up a little more as this storm generates across the race course. Well, DF Young is a 50-foot mystic. It's the largest boat in the class, and I guarantee Hugh Fuller and Rich Wyatt, Richie Wyatt, want to see this rough water because I think that boat will do very well uh, in these particular conditions. It'll be interesting to see how that boat runs as Pothole Heroes runs south towards Milwaukee. As Thomas and I have gotten a lot closer under our short little tent here, trying to stay as dry as possible. Pretty now, is heavy that rain. Red on one side, blue on the other. Yep. Okay. Yep. I like that design. Pothole Heroes is a pothole repairing system that Carlos got hooked up with. I guess it's an all-in-one machine, uh, from what I understand. That will. Uh, Repair potholes. Well, hey, could, could, could Carlos call the city of St. Paul and <laughs> employ this at the, ci in the city? Anybody who works for the city of St. Paul, Minnesota, you need to check out a pothole hero because I'll tell you, my neighborhood in St. Paul, it was so bad they had to go just manually fill potholes 
because people's cars were getting destroyed because we had so much snow. There was 140 inches of snow in Minneapolis and St. Paul this this winter or somewhere about. So the roads got absolutely destroyed from the amount of plowing that we had to do. So, hey, City of St. Paul, call up Pothole Heroes, please. Save my car. All right, DF Young comes around at turn number one. They're going to start their parade lap as Pothole Heroes goes around. 222 Offshore Australia Navy with a 345-1. They are currently your leaders in qualifying in Class 1. Husky Ice Spritz in second, 4.63 seconds behind. Let's see what Johnny Tomlinson and Carlos Quesada. Case, i got to understand how to pronounce his last name. I apologize, Carlos. We will get clarity on that. But let's see how Johnny and Carlos do on their first lap as the conditions continue not to really deteriorate here, but it is starting to rain a little bit harder. And I look over behind us, and I do see where the rain is coming from. Uh, I will know that our production company is listening to us. They may want to get us a towel or something up here to maybe throw over uh, our switchboard as we are trying to protect it as best we can. As Pothole Heroes, actually that was DF Young that just went through the shot there. Here is Pothole Heroes, Johnny and... Okay, they pull off to the inside, so they have completed their two laps of qualifying. And it looks like either they didn't get one recorded or they didn't post up after lap one. I don't know if they're just posting us their best of two, so we got to wait till each one. But look at the visibility, just brutal out there. Now, obviously, rough for your guys. My guys are so used to zero visibility because they're running through rooster, rooster tails, tails all right. the time that, that you know, rain doesn't typically bother them. It's lightning that when, when well, you yeah, start that's pretty much anything. Anything, like, anything. Yeah, right? yeah, we'll race in rain. The only reason we the only reason we won't race in rain is we run a helicopter for support. So if the helicopter can't fly because of visibility, then we won't race because we won't have the helicopter up in the air. And that's actually what happened in Michigan City, Indiana last weekend. That's what caused one of the delays there. Uh, is it was such bad visibility they couldn't run with the helicopter, so they had to delay that race. DF Young, boat number 17, the 50 foot Mystic, one of my all time favorite. Beautiful boat, beautiful line to this boat built by John Cosker out of the Land, Florida. Again, this boat used to run Herb Stotler, 1,500 horsepower supercharged Woo! engines back in the Unlimited class days. Of course, Richie Wyatt decided, you know, he wanted to come out here and run in class one, re rebuilt the boat with the Mercury 1100. Herb Stotler did that down in Georgia. A Stotler racing engines. He actually re-rigged the boat for Richie. Been working on it for years. Well, a big hop there going into the corner. They set oh, it down on the back corner. And look at that. Pothole Heroes with a 339. Wow. Knocking down the uh, the 222 offshore by over five seconds. Five seconds. Now, I mean, they were wow. booking one out there. But to me, that seems surprising. I know the Pothole Heroes hasn't been has had some struggles finishing right throughout the class one schedule and, and it's a race of attrition right you can't finish first if you first don't finish right, right. uh but boy what a run for them that's and impressive that can speak really good things for this mystic because it loves that rough water being 50 feet well yeah and the the pothole heroes boat as i said is a little bit bigger than 222 and husky ice spritz so maybe that was to their advantage out here today but a 339 almost six almost six seconds faster uh than 222 offshore and now husky ice spritz is now 10 seconds behind uh, the Pothole Heroes boat. So an interesting shakeup here. Let's see if Johnny and Carlos can stay in that pole position as DF Young comes around for their qualifying. Up, up, up next will be the MTI of X Insurance and Good Boy Vodka. Randy Kent, Grant Bruggerman uh, in the MTI are going to come up next. Uh, that's also a good rough order boat from what I understand, so it'll be interesting to see how they run out here in these conditions. This is going to be their second race together. Of course, coming on the podium, third place in Michigan City, Indiana, and their first time in the boat. Randy Kent, Grant Bruggerman up next in X Insurance. Good Boy Vodka, D.F. Young. They are going to come across the start-finish line. They finish line one more time on the Monster Mile up towards turn number one. And that should complete their qualifying as well. Oh, it's oh that's the start of their second lap. Yeah, I it's apologize. starting to get so rough there. We can't, our camera guys are even struggling to get good, clean views of the uh, uh, them coming up this uh, Monster Energy straightaway here. It seems like we almost have a better view looking at the boat, and he pulled yep. off there. So they are done with their qualifying. Let's see where D.F. Young comes in. 12 seconds off the pace in that 50-foot Mystic. All right. Well, that's not exactly where Richie and Hugh want to be in qualifying, but the conditions, ever-changing conditions here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, you can look down towards <coughs> – excuse me. You can look down towards the power plant. Now the sun's starting to come out. Like that buoy right there, those sit out off the power plant, and now the sun's starting to shine down there. So the rain, I think, is moving a little bit south to north possibly. Uh, as it is starting to lighten up a little bit. But not, now look, now it's starting to flatten out. Now the waves are starting to calm down just a little bit. Right on. Now, could that be what the doctor ordered for the Good Boy, uh, Good Boy Vodka X insurance machine or that uh, MCON machine that still have yet to run out there as long with the DeFalco? Possibly, yep. 
because they have. I mean, from when we started well, it, qualifying, it, it, well, these it'll be interesting are to see if they smaller. put a, if they put a rough water setup on their boats and it flattens out, then they're going to be in some trouble. Uh, that does will that have a does it just adverse suck effect. Does it just suck the boat to the water and just does it allow that air to just get Just won't underneath? get the top speed, won't get enough lift, and won't get the top speed out of it that they want to get. So now it's DeFalco. Uh, they are up on a plane, so it looks like they are going to qualify next. Uh, they were scheduled to go sixth, and now they've moved up to the fifth spot, so we'll see what happens there. Pothole Heroes, number one with a 339.48. Five seconds behind that, 222 Offshore Australia Navy. Ten seconds behind that, Husky one. Ice spritz and then DF Young about 12, 13 seconds off the pace. Right on, Carlos. Carlos has got to feel real good in that. Once he get, I don't know how much communication they have with crew chief and the and, and the and the rest of the rest of the team on land. Yep. Or if that communication just lives within the cockpit. But obviously they've got to know now that they have almost a six second lead over the uh, the current leaders on the 2023 Class One Championship. Uh, point standings and to pull that big of a lead that I mean it seems to me like that was something that was quite surprising even for somebody like you who's been doing this for as long as you have to see them pull that big of a lead over the team that's been clearly the front runner all year well and it I, you know I won't say it'll give them a false sense of security but remember we've said it since we've started broadcasting this qualifying session conditions are going to change tomorrow so where they were real comfortable out here and what was out here today it's going to completely change now they're going to be on the pole pole position obviously just like in f1 racing that's where you want to be you yes. want to control that inside lane you have to maintain your lane through the corner uh and you're going to have to run the shortest distance around the course now when you get on these straightaways you know obviously things will change and they're going to want to go as fast as they possibly can so it'll be interesting to see talk to johnny and carlos a little bit later and kind of see what they think about qualifying in their setup for tomorrow so this is defalco the Outer Limits boat, Mike DeFalco out of New York. Billy Moore out of North Carolina. Billy Moore, of course, Bobby Moore's son, started the throttle man position, but Billy Moore in his own right, another world championship throttle man. Just joining forces with Mike Falco. Big Whoa, hop there, yep. there. yeah. A lot of air. Way on its tail there. That's going to kill a ton of speed down the front straightaway, which is the last thing they need now, knowing – uh, that they've got to find a pace that's six seconds faster than the uh, the leaders on the series championship, which have been, from what I've watched coming into this day, prepping for this weekend, it clearly seemed that 222 offshore had been the class of class one oh, all yeah. season long. They were definitely coming into this weekend to be the one to beat. So very surprising uh, that they're six seconds down here in qualifying. Um, Darren and Nick, Dar Darren and Giovanni will have some work to do when they go back to figure out their setup. A couple big hops there, and of course, it looked like to me DeFalco went a little bit wider in the corners than I was expecting, maybe to carry a little bit more speed. X Insurance, Good Boy Vodka, number 11, the MTI. Randy Kent, Grant Bruggerman now it's taking to the course for qualifying. So, Pothole Heroes, boat number 022, your number one spot with a 339 48. Three boats left to qualify DeFalco, X Insurance, Good Boy Vodka, and Monster Energy MCON left to go here in qualifying in class one that will wrap up our broadcast for today once this is over and i believe we're kicking your stuff off at 10 o'clock in the morning correct yep we start off with our four minutes uh pl plus one lap uh, fast lap qualifier so we basically put them all on the water and you get five minutes to lay down the fastest elapsed time around the course you look at a 345 here move that three minutes right we're going to be probably running right. between 30 39 and 45 second lap times depending on the conditions. Obviously, uh, you know, the wind could change, but if the swells are still rolling into the harbor, it's going to make things a little bit trickier for our Formula One tunnel boats. Uh, just the sheer size of the roll, swells and waves that come in here off the shores of Lake Michigan. And the swell really surprised me that came in from this little harbor that we're in here. I mean, they're pretty big waves in there, but now, of course, it looks like it's calmed down just a little bit. It does look like it's flattening out a bit in front of us. And on Lake Michigan. I but think that's unique just because the wind was coming in directly yep. almost out of the east. It was pushing the waves right in that opening. I think if you saw them coming out of the west, north, or dead south, uh, I think you wouldn't see nearly as many rollers in the harbor here, and that's what we're hoping for tomorrow. Well, and that's probably why they built these great big breakwaters out here because it gets so probably rough here on Lake Michigan that to protect the Yacht Club and all the boats in here, they probably built all these big breakwaters to protect them. Here is DeFalco. They are currently qualifying. They will come by and complete their second lap and wrap up their qualifying run. X Insurance Good Boy Vodka now going in the north end of the course. Turns one, two, three, and four. Big, wide, sweeping, four pin turn as DeFalco now on the south end of the course, as we described, down towards Milwaukee on the other side of the power plant. 
and will start to run north towards the finish line. Let's see what DeFalco and X Insurance Good Boy Vod and, can do. And you definitely, you know, somebody who's newer to Class 1, you can really see the skill set that the throttle man brings to the table, especially as they go through those turns. You can oh, really yeah. heal, hear them pulling off the throttle, putting back into the throttle, and you can hear that motor revving yep. uh, up and down as they try to keep it on the water and keep it clean moving through the turns. Well, you can really hear it when they exit that buoy turn number four and they head down. Wow, big here there by X Insurance. We're kind of watching it live on our screen and live uh, right in front of us on our main lift here. But uh, DeFalco, number 18, they're going to get ready to cross the finish line in just a short while here and wrap up qualifying for that team. Pothole Heroes with a 339. Nobody even close. Five seconds behind, 222 offshore. Australia Navy and Husky Ice Brits currently in third. One, two, three, and four. DF Young in fourth. So those are is your four the, lanes. Is, is that DeFalco, the lone outer limits here running yep, in Class 1? Yep, that's one? the only outer, outer limits in Class 1. There's one outer limits runs in Supercat, and there's one outer limits that runs in Class 1. Of course, Billy Moore, his first, second time in the boat. This is also uh, all of our boats here are rudder boats with BPM surface drives, but, of course, Billy has been running Class 1 and has a tremendous amount uh, of experience offshore racing. Mike DeFalco, not quite as much of experience, but he's getting it figured out. Uh, and again, this is a brand new boat, so they don't really have any sort of a baseline to go off of. It's like imagine building an, a brand new F1 tunnel boat, not having any information to go off of. Every race you do, uh, you're learning information. Sean Torrente and Sean Connor, who are going to run uh, tomorrow in the it's AMR construction boat. boat. Yep, the, well, that's the MTI. Um, no, that's yeah, that's the MTI that they bought from the Victory team. Right, yeah, and then and they split it in half, and they completely restructured the boat. Oh, yeah, a lot of work in the off season, and I, I, honestly, you could tell that they were still dialing in even at Lodo. Oh, when yeah. they went to Lodo, they were way off the pace on the first day. They did a bunch of setup changes after testing in the morning. They did a little bit better, but definitely not where I'm used to seeing Sean Randy when you talk multi-time Formula One world champion on the Formula 1 H2O Series, yep. national and world champion here in the APBA, um, as well as I think he's won, what, what what's the the, the, the the super stock class, what they call it over in Europe. He ran for Abu Dhabi. He's won over there with them. Uh, they're running oh. the twins 300Rs on the back, or was it the the old uh, XS motors before the 300Rs came out? But it's weird to see a guy like that mired back in fourth, fifth, sixth position. It's just strange. Well, but they won in Sarasota. So, so, and Sarasota was a nasty water race uh, just because of the conditions. All right, so DeFalco comes across. They are 19.99 seconds behind first place Pothole Hero. So they are currently, going, currently in fifth position in qualifying. Two boats left to go. X Insurance, Good Boy Vodka, they should start their second lap this time by. And then we have Monster Energy MCON, Tyler Miller and Myrick Coyle. Of course, Myrick Coyle will pull double duty. Myrick Coyle, actually one of the racers now that pulls triple duty. He actually runs in super stock in the Performance Boat Center Fast Diesel Fuel Systems entry. Then he'll usually get into the number 06 uh, MCON Monster Energy boat, which runs in Supercat. And then he will hop into Monster Energy MCON and run in Class 1. So pulling triple duty here for Myrick Coyle at Guy some sure races. likes to race boats, doesn't he? He does like to race boats. He's very well respected uh, in the industry. X-Cat, that's what we called it, X-Cat. There we go, yes. I love that you have people feeding you information on your phone. Uh, Sometimes it's a little distracting. Sometimes <laughs> it gets to you uh, just a little bit. But he comes across, you know, and I noticed with the DeFalco scene a little bit here with the X Insurance as they come into the uh, north end of the course here is a lot more of that left-to-right list of, of the boat Bouncing yep. back and forth, these last two coming down this front straightaway here on the Monster Energy straightaway. You didn't see that from the Pothole Heroes or even the 222 Offshore or even the Husky Ice Spritz. But these last two you've seen, so I'm curious to see as the X Insurance comes in 16 seconds off the pace. So I don't know what has changed out there on the conditions, but it seems like they're really struggling down this Monster Energy straightaway. And clearly you can see it really peeling some time off their lap speeds. Well, and as I watched X, X Insurance Copa Vaca go through the turn, I was really impressed with their entry speed into the corner between turns one and two. I thought to myself, wow, they went into that corner pretty hard and pretty fast. So uh, didn't quite expect to see them in fifth for qualifying. But let's see what Monster Energy MCON. These are the last two boats to go, and we will wrap up qualifying. The Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge coming to you live from beautiful Sheboygan, Wisconsin. We have a little bit of a rain shower pass through. Sun's starting to come back out as they get everything set up for what will be a great weekend of offshore powerboat racing and F1 tunnel boat racing here in Sheboygan. Got a rainbow out there uh, just to the west uh, or east, rather, of our broadcast booth as the sun starts to come out and that rain pushes off to look to be what is the northeast. So Monster Energy MCON, boat number 06, brand new Skater Hull. Myrick and Tyler still working to get this figured out, get this boat running. Went through a lot of, uh, they've done a lot of work to this boat. It went in the water, I think, like three or four days before it left for Cocoa Beach. Uh, 
<laughs> Myrick and Jake ran it for just about 25 minutes, put it back on the trailer, and shipped it south. And, uh, you know, they, they've had to fight some gremlins, as, of course, you would expect with a brand-new boat. Uh, and, of course, the, they're the lone skater in this class. So as we talked about the lone Outer Limits or the lone MTI, they have no baseline to go with that boat either. So they're learning that boat, learning how to run the boat. They're very successful in Supercat, one Supercat uh, in Michigan City after a very tough race in Sarasota, Florida, when their boat caught on fire uh, because they lost a water pump. That was a very scary situation. X Insurance, Good Boy Vodka, currently in the fifth position for qualifying. I do like what I see out of Monster Energy MCON, though. They look really going through the corner. A lot of speed entering the corner, but I said nice the same thing about X too. Insurance. Yeah, yeah, running real flat, looking good. Getting that boat figured out as X Insurance Good Boy Vodka enters the turn, uh, enters exits pin 10 rather, uh, towards the finish line to complete their second lap of qualifying. Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge. Make sure to come by the waterfront here. We're going to have vendors set up. You can buy race team t shirts. We've got VP Fuel set up over here. Mercury Racing has their display truck. Uh, Allen Lawn Care Landscaping's got their merchandise trailer. I saw Marine Technology, uh, the MTI team, Taylor Sism, has her uh, trailer over here. So that we'll have T-shirts uh, for sale all weekend long. Make sure to come down and check us out. P1 Offshore, keep up with your favorite teams and your schedule and see when we will be in a town near you. When this race wraps up, our next race will be St. Petersburg, Florida, Labor Day weekend. Go to p1offshore.com for more information. Thomas, where do you go after this? After this, we head down to the great state of Oklahoma. That's for beer, boating, and barbecue. Yeah, it, uh, I think it, yes. Boats, brews, and boats, BBQ. Boats, brews, Something and BBQ. Something like that. Yeah, I, yep. I'm still, you know, th these, a new partner of us, uh, uh, I believe it's it's an entertainment group. They're actually doing a couple of our races this year. We've okay. got this race in Oklahoma. They've taken over uh, running our race down in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, at the end of October, where we finish our season. Which, a uh, kid from Minnesota, could you ask for a better t place to be? Go hang the, out. Go hang October, out in the desert. In the desert, nice and warm still when it's you know the snow starting to creep up on you in Minnesota. But yeah, same as you and being in Florida on Labor Day weekend, we're going to be in northeastern Oklahoma, about four hours south southwest to Lake of the Ozarks. There, just right. right in the northeast corner of Oklahoma in a little a community called Grove, Oklahoma, a beautiful, not what you would expect when you think Oklahoma, right? Flat, dry, uh, open, not the case at all. Very excited to get down there uh, to Grove for our penultimate round of 2023. X Insurance moves up into the four spot, 10 seconds behind your leader, Pothole Heroes, and just about four one-hundredths of a second behind, or yeah, four one-hundredths of a second behind Husky Ice Sprit. So a really good run for X Insurance Good Boy Vodka on their second lap. Yes. I told you that I thought that boat looked really going, uh, good. As it entered the turn, they carried a good amount of speed. So good job by Grant Bruggerman and Randy Kent. Second time in the boat. The lone boat out here, Monster Energy, MCON, Tyler Miller, Myrick Coyle only race in one boat, so they'll be able to relax a little bit more this weekend. A lot of air under that boat. They look pretty loose, a lot of positive trim, trying to get as much speed out of it as they can. Yeah, we, I actually saw this boat run uh, as uh, the exhibition. They let him slide in with the 450R yep. class to get a little bit of seat time there. And, boy, this boat looks a lot faster than it did at Lake of the Ozarks just a couple of months ago. And they're getting it figured out. You know, uh, you know it, it just it's a completely different animal than what they're used to with their Supercat boat. Of course, they are your defending national champions in Supercat and your winners last weekend in Michigan City, Indiana. So they've got their Supercat program figured out. I know Tyler Miller very well, one of the nicest guys uh, in the pits, made a huge investment in our sport going to a two-boat team. You know, just not a lot of two-boat teams out there anymore. And, uh, you know, he decided, uh, you know, about a year and a half ago that he wanted to go Class 1 racing when all this was starting to come about. You know, Steve Curtis was w working with Ozum and the P1 group to really bring Class 1 to the U.S. It really appealed to Tyler. And he went out and built this boat to come out and go class one racing and let's see how they do in qualifying they're going to wrap up their first lap and start their second lap let's see what they can do so it's pothole heroes in the number one spot 222 offshore in the second spot husky ice spritz third x insurance fourth df young fifth mcon monster energy gets now sixth place and bumps defalco all the way back to seventh beautiful shot of that green and white livery on x insurance good boy vodka of course x insurance a sponsor of p1 offshore racing they'll provide our helicopter footage tomorrow and sunday during the race thanks to x insurance for supporting our series as well as good boy vodka i know good boy vodka hooked up with some mercury racing uh I think it's every poor saves a pup or every poor helps a pup. So I know they've done some yeah. things here uh, with some of our veterans and pups to get them linked up together and get some companionship to our veterans. Have to give a shout out to all of our military branches. We wouldn't be here doing this without the Coast Guard, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force. Of course, United States Coast Guard has a station right behind us, uh, just in the harbor here in Sheboygan. 
of the, on the Sheboygan River. So thanks to the Coast Guard there, instrumental in being able to make an event like this happen. Thanks to all the local support. A lot of people in town have a lot to do with this race. A lot of municipalities, the police, the fire department, EMS. It's really a joint effort. It is. I mean, the whole city's got to be involved. It yep. either got to be all in or it just doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah, it takes it takes an army to do it. I've done it for many, many years, and it's not an easy thing to do, especially a brand new uh, race site. There were probably a lot of sleepless nights, and this will probably be a pretty sleepless weekend for a lot of people. But uh, thanks to Sheboygan, the entire city, for having us here. It's an awesome town. Super pumped to be here, having a great time so far as we wrap up qualifying here in class one tomorrow 10 o'clock in the morning we will start our race day we will race till about four o'clock in the afternoon with all kinds of various activities go to p1 offshore for more information or google mercury racing midwest challenge to follow the schedule and see what we've got going on on saturday yeah, absolutely. We've got uh, looks like we've got some two seaters rides going oh, on yeah, for experience people. Ride, yep. Yeah, that's a, a good time. We got a it's a side by side, so much like a more looking like a cockpit of an offshore yep. boat, uh, but still of that seventeen foot. But tunnel it's got a foot throttle in it. That a little bit different. Foot throttle, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure, uh, very different there. But yeah, then we've got our testing and qualifying starting. Sorry, at ten thirty a.m. Ten thirty. Okay. And then we're gonna have the opening ceremonies at uh, right there at eleven a.m. Harbor closes for a half hour, and then we get right back to it with more Formula One. So Formula One in the morning up until the, the lunch hour, and then after the lunch hour, we really get rolling with cla with all the offshore stuff in the Class One Race One, the 450R Race One, and then the Super Stock Race One to wrap up the afternoon. How many boats can we expect in a heat? In ours? We're running all of our guys at the same time. We've got eight boats here again. We have kind of a split field still, right? We haven't migrated to the brand new Mercury power units as okay. as, as well as the offshore classes have. Um, and also that's because, right, you guys have had more new motors introduced by Mercury and by yep. the manufacturers than we've had. The APX competition is the first tunnel racing outboard, right, that's designed specific, for tunnel boats. Specific. Since the EFI came out, what, in the early 80s, mid 80s? Wow. It's been a very long time. Now, we had the Optimax, right, that ran. So fair enough. I guess there was one in between there, the Optimax. Um, but this is the first one in a while. And so we haven't had all of our drivers, right, adopt. Everybody's got different programs. They've got different yep. schedules. Yep. And so only a portion of our full fleet. Normally, we're running anywhere between 18 to 25 boats. Okay. Well, only eight of our guys. We had. We would have nine. Unfortunately, one of our guys, Chris Fairchild, the PBA president, unable to be here this weekend, um, and so we had to go down from eight, nine to eight. But eight tough competitors, and they have on the a, exact on a same very power small points, course, and they are going to be all over one another. Um, and so we'll run them all, all through qualifying, all qualifying heats, and in the main event. Because again, right, it's all about who gets that inside pole position for the main event. That's really what everybody's shooting for. All right, Monster Energy MCON comes around. This will complete their second and final lap of qualifying and wrap up qualifying here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Mercury Racing Midwest Challenge Racing kicks off 10.30 tomorrow morning with qualifying and testing for the F1 group. All the offshore stuff will take place later in the afternoon. We have the military ribbon bridge ceremony taking place tomorrow afternoon between F1 and offshore. And that's one thing that blows my mind that the super stocks and uh, the 450Rs, they don't qualify. They just draw straws for position? Yeah, so uh, qualifying is something pretty, it's, it's not new to offshore power racing, right? I, you know, the class one guys did it overseas and you know people have done qualifying before, but when you have to shut down a body of water, it really takes, it's hard to do it for two days in a row, right? Like it's hard to get all the assets into place and say, okay, we're going to shut down this body of water for two days to, not, to allow these boats to be able to go out and qualify. They can't qualify where there's traffic running around and so on and so forth. Right. So they have to have full control of the water. So it's really hard to be able to do that. Plus, I mean, it takes a while, right? Like not a lot of boats went out and tested this morning. One, because they, they kind of didn't want to because of how rough it was, but we had a very compressed schedule today, and we do have that. We have it on weekends because now uh, with P1 Offshore Racing, we race on Saturday and we race on Sundays. We do the bracket classes uh, on Saturday and Super Stock on Saturday, and then we do the remaining bracket classes on Sunday. And, you know, Class, class 1, Super Cat, Super Cat. Uh, V Extreme, uh, Mod Vigos. But let's take a look at our results for qualifying. Boat number 2-2, two, two, Pothole Heroes with a 339-48, their best lap. Triple 2 Offshore, 2-2-2 two, two, two Offshore Australian Navy in second with a 345. Husky Ice Spritz with a 349. Not much of a gap there. Look at that t second, third, and fourth place results between 2-2-2 two, two, two Husky Ice Spritz and X Insurance. Mere seconds. 
separating each one of those teams. DF Young coming across in fifth with a 352. Monster Energy MCON 355 and Team DeFalco with a 359. Your top seven for Class 1. We're going to wrap up Class 1 qualifying. Go to p1offshore.com. Keep up with your favorite team. Follow the schedule. If you are in Sheboygan, Milwaukee, or anywhere nearby, Thomas and I recommend you come down here. Check out all the vendors and the T-shirts. I probably should have brought an extra suitcase because I'll probably go home with some extra T-shirts this weekend for my kid and for me. I am Mike Uwaski, Thomas Yarbro. Thanks for hanging out for qualifying. We Absolutely. look forward to uh, F1 championships tomorrow. Matt Trulia will be joining us tomorrow for the broadcast as well. I'm Mike Uwaski, Thomas Yarbro. This has been Class 1 Qualifying. We'll see you tomorrow.